Good afternoon and welcome to today's New York City Council meeting on resiliencies and waterfronts, joints with trans transportation and infrastructure. At this time, please put all electronic devices on silent and vibrate mode. If you want to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you, chairs. We may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Ari Kagan, and I have the privilege of chairing the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts. I want to thank my co-chair, Majority Whip Brooks Powers, for holding this hearing. She will be here very soon. Saturday, October 29th, will mark the 10th anniversary of the Superstorm Sandy. Ten years ago, Superstorm Sandy devastated our city. Uh, including areas with uh, seawater, uh, leaving almost 2 million people without power, destroying approximately 300 homes and causing an estimated $19 billion in damages and lost economic activity. After flood, water, uh, after flood waters receded, we came together to start rebuilding. But 10 years later, we are still not there yet. We are not finished. Last session, we passed the local law 122 which requires the city of New York to create a comprehensive city-wide climate adaptation plan. The plan, which was due by September 30th, would evaluate the various climate hazards facing the city, including extreme storms, sea level rise, tidal flooding, extreme heat, and extreme precipitation, and recommended resiliency and adaptation measures to protect residents, property, and infrastructure. This plan is a critical tool in the city toolbox so we are protected against the effects of climate change. But we are still waiting for details of this plan to be submitted to New York City Council. I am aware about announcement today in the morning, and I would be glad to hear more details about it. And uh, I hope communities will be informed as well all over the city about this important um, plan announced today in the morning by, by the mayor. Two weeks ago, the New York City controller released a report on the city's progress in using federal Sandy recovery and resiliency grants, implementing recovery and resiliency projects, and what essential infrastructure is at risk from coastal flooding. This report highlights how the city has spent less than 75% of the $15 billion received in federal recovery and resiliency grants after Superstorm Sandy. Additionally, some funded projects will not be completed until 2030, that is almost 20 years after Superstorm Sandy. What happens if the city experiences another superstorm similar to Sandy before 2030? Rising tides and more frequent and intense storms will continue to threaten and put the city's residents and infrastructure at risk every day. What has been done since the committee first hearing right here in April? During today's hearing, I'm interested to hear what engagement this administration had with elected officials, community boards, community groups, envir envir environmental groups, and the public on resiliency projects and to educate people about the need to be prepared. We will also hear resolution number 81, sponsored by Council Member Brennan. This resolution calls upon Congress to amend the Stafford Act so that Federal Emergency Management Agency and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development proactively fund coastal resiliency projects. Federal funds must not be tied to a severe weather event or national disaster that has already occurred. We have had 10 years to think about extreme weather events that we know will continue to worsen. We can and must do better for our city. I look forward to hearing from the Department of Environmental Protection, the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice, the Department of Transportation, on steps that our city is taking now to better prepare for the next climate disaster. I also look forward to hearing from uh, Chief Anthony Siora from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Coastal Restoration and Special Projects Branch, who will testify about the Corps recently released tentatively selected plan, Entire One Environmental Impact Study for the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary Study. Before we begin, I would like to thank my committee staff, Senior Committee Counsel Jessica Steinberg-Albin, Senior Policy Analyst Patrick Mulvihill, 
Finance analyst Andrew Lane Lawless, my chief of staff Janine Kerikezi, my legislative director Alex Timkiv, as well as the staff for the infrastructure, uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, for all their hard work putting this important hearing together. Um, so now I would like to turn to uh, council, uh, committee council Jessica Steinberg. Thank you, Chair Kagan. Um, I will now swear in the administration so that they can testify. Do you affirm to tell the truth in your testimony before the committees today and to answer honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Just make sure the red light is on. I do. Great. You may be again. Thank you so much. All right. Um, Good, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Kagan and uh, members of the Committees on Resilience and Waterfronts and Transportation and Infrastructure. N my name is Rohit T. Agarwal. I'm the Could you speak a little bit louder? I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I'm Rohit T. Agarwal, the city's chief climate officer and commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today about the Adams administration's work to adapt to climate change, which presents, as we know, an existential threat to New York City and the 8.6 million New Yorkers who call this city home. I'm joined today by Kizzy Charles Guzman, the executive director of the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice, senior policy advisor for climate ready infrastructure, Jordan Salinger, and colleagues from a number of agencies, including DOT, DDC, Parks, HRO, NYCHA, and EDC, and several others that I'm sure I've uh, missed, but uh, we are all here to answer questions since I know there will be a number directed at uh, many specific agencies. This week, as you point out, uh, Mr. Chairman, we commemorate the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Sandy, the deadliest and most destructive natural disaster in our city's history. It cost 44 New Yorkers their lives, it upended neighborhoods, and it caused, as you said, $19 billion in damage and economic loss. It was, sadly, exactly the kind of catastrophe that climate scientists had already been predicting. I'm here today to report on what has happened since the storm. I'll detail this administration's approach to climate change adaptation, focusing on the ways it is informed by the lessons of the past decade and advancements in global and local thinking about risk mitigation. Finally, I'll talk about the challenges that we must jointly address to make New York City resilient. I would like to leave you with a few key messages today. First, there is a lot to be grateful for in the work that New York City and its partners have accomplished in the last decade. New York City is much better prepared for a storm like Sandy than it was 10 years ago. But equally, there is much work still to be done. Second. Hurricane Ida last year reminded us that we cannot afford to make the mistake of fighting the last war. Sandy was a coastal inundation event. Ida was a rainstorm. In the 10 years since Sandy, heat waves have killed six times as many New Yorkers as Sandy and Ida combined. What this tells us is that going forward, the Adams administration must and will be pursuing an approach to climate resilience that is focused equally on all of the risks that climate change poses to New York. Third, we must consider greenhouse gas reduction strategies as a core part of our resilience efforts. We must treat every aspect of Local on 97, every bus lane proposal, each land use decision, each step on the road to congestion pricing and organics collection as part of our climate resilience strategy. Finally, resilience is not something that will have a completion date. This is an ongoing task that is going to be part of government for the rest of our lives. As I said, we should recognize that we are much safer and better prepared for a coastal inundation event than we were 10 years ago. This is a result of tremendous efforts by both government and communities, along with huge investments, approximately $15 billion in federal funding and over $5 billion from city taxpayers. We should think of post-Sandy work as having three very different components. One was helping people whose homes and businesses had been damaged. The Build It Back program served 8,319 single-family homeowners and 141 multifamily developments, elevating, repairing, and acquiring, uh, acquiring homes. EDC and SBS programs served nearly 1,000 Sandy-impacted small businesses. The second was a significant program undertaken, especially by NYCHA and also by private building owners, 
to make their properties less likely to suffer long-term damage if another Sandy-like event happens. NYCHA has spent over $2.7 billion to protect over 200 buildings from storm surge and power outages. Build It Back's multifamily program has assisted more than 19,600 households through assistance for repairs, resiliency upgrades, and rental assistance. A key aspect of resilience is not just physical, but institutional. And since, and since 2012, the number of New Yorkers with flood insurance has increased by about 50%, in large part through the city's Flood Help and Y program, a partnership with FEMA and the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. New York City Emergency Management has worked to ensure that we are better to, uh, equipped to respond when storms hit. We've updated the city's emergency protocols, including new evacuation maps and response equipment. A third aspect of the post-Sandy work is neighborhood-scale coastal protection, exemplified by the work done by the Army Corps in the Rockaways and by the city on the Lower East Side. In addition to the more than $1 billion in work being paid for directly by the Army Corps, the city has received nearly $600 million from federal grants and investing, and investing over $2.7 billion from city capital for this kind of large-scale coastal resiliency work. We've completed construction on several shorefront projects, including the 5.5-mile-long Rockaway Boardwalk, nearly 10 miles of new dunes across Staten Island and the Rockaway Peninsula, and coastal wetland restorations in Sunset Cove in Queens and Sawmill Creek in Staten Island. The largest portion of this money, however, will be spent over the next two to three years, as we have several additional major projects that are now in construction. This morning, I was honored to join Mayor Adams for the groundbreaking of two of these key products, projects, including the Brooklyn Bridge to Montgomery Coastal Resilience Project and the Howard Beach Raise the Shoreline Project in Queens. We also expect to break ground on the Travis Avenue Raised Shoreline Project by the end of the year and the Staten Island Coastal Storm Risk Management Project in the new year. There is, of course, a great deal more that needs to be done. First, we need to ensure that all of our projects with the Army Corps are successful. We are still waiting for that South Shore of Staten Island project, long recognized to be a top priority as an area that suffered mo the most concentrated loss of life to break ground. There have been challenges uh, because the Army Corps' congressionally defined mission was only to protect against coastal flooding, while the project must concurrently remediate contamination and avoid creating new stormwater flooding risks inland. Second. We need the Army Corps' uh, harbor and tributary study, HATS, to be a success to protect more of our coastal communities. In 2016, the Army Corps began studying coastal risk for the North Atlantic seaboard. Last month, as you pointed out, Chair, they released a tentatively selected plan which envisions a network of coastal defenses along with sea barriers at key locations. We are reviewing this report and working with the Army Corps, government partners, and the public to ensure that the final recommendation reflects the needs of all New Yorkers. I urge you to spread the news about this study and help facilitate conversations about the plan. There are two key things we know the city will need from whatever plan is ultimately adopted by the Corps. We will need our congressional delegation to ensure that the project receives the necessary funding. And we will need the enabling legislation to provide the Corps with a broad enough mandate to assist with the city's multifaceted efforts to protect against multiple types of flooding and protect water quality. All of this adds up to a direct response to Hurricane Sandy. But Sandy is far from the only climate change impact we face. As I said, Hurricane Ida demonstrated that storm water can also kill, and heat waves, as I said, kill many more New Yorkers than flooding. While drought is not New York City's greatest risk, our overall water supply is indeed at risk from the combination of sea level rise and drought, particularly, I'll point out, in the Delaware River, not the Hudson. As a result, we will pursue a multi-hazard approach to climate resilience. Such an approach addresses all the climate threats that impact our city, including both catastrophic ones like coastal inundation, but also chronic ones like rising heat and ongoing tidal flooding. In keeping with this approach, we have already undertaken multiple new efforts to protect New Yorkers. Our housing plan, Housing Our Neighbors, a blueprint for housing and homelessness, included a significant focus on keeping us safe in our homes during floods, heat emergencies, and in the face of a changing climate. To combat extreme heat, we have implemented Cool Neighborhoods NYC, 
a $106 million program to keep us safe and cool through expanding tree canopy and programs to connect vulnerable residents to community volunteers. We have allocated an additional $112 million to tree planting in our most heat vulnerable communities. To combat extreme rainfall, we have, we have released both rainfall ready and our stormwater resilience vision. Rainfall Ready outlines immediate steps to combat extreme rainfall, and the vision lays out our transformative approach to managing stormwater, with commitments in how we plan drainage, deploy green infrastructure, and rapidly expand our cloudburst and bluebelt programs. You'll be hearing more about how we will implement that vision this spring. Today, we announced several important policy steps. First, releasing ADAPT NYC, New York City's climate change, resilience, uh, climate change adaptation strategy. Second, launching Climate Strong Communities, the, six, the city's next generation of adaptation projects, which is, I'd argue, really part and parcel of that overall adaptation strategy. Advocating for progressive design build um, through state legislation that will help us get these projects and other projects done more quickly. And finally, requesting a dedicated federal funding stream for coastal resiliency projects. The first of these, ADAPT, is the city's approach to climate resilience in, partners, in partnership and in keeping with the city council mandate of Local Law 221 of 2021. Because resilience planning requires neighborhood engagement, we are releasing this plan as a web-based resource. It identifies the climate change challenges that pose the greatest threats, the populations and neighborhoods that are most at risk, and the resilience and adaptation measures the city is taking to protect residents, property, and infrastructure. We are now launching Climate Strong Communities, a program that will develop the next generation of resilience and sustainability projects centered on environmental justice, and which will be proactive, multi-hazard, and targeted to vulnerable areas left out of previous Hurricane Sandy-focused funding. Climate Strong Communities will design and accelerate resilience and sustainability investments with the explicit intent of maximizing opportunities for federal and state infrastructure funding coming down the pike. Further, as we know, a key challenge facing resilience efforts is that city projects simply move too slowly. The Capital Project Delivery Reform Task Force, led by First Deputy Mayor uh, Grillo in partnership with Controller Lander, is critical to our future resilience efforts. As part of that, Today, the mayor called on the governor and the legislature to pass progressive design build legislation for the city, a modern form of contracting used widely by the state government and the private sector. We cannot afford to continue to deny the city the most effective approaches to fast, safe, and responsible project delivery. Finally, the mayor today asked the federal government to recognize that climate resilience is going to be the work of generations. Just as previous generations recognize new roles for government, resilience will be a key task of government as long as anyone in this room is alive. Like transportation, housing, and education, we need to shift to a federal formula-based approach so that cities like New York can plan projects with an understanding of what long-term funding looks like. These initiatives announced today are just one step toward our overall resilience strategy. We will re release an updated citywide sustainability plan this coming April. That plan will include a significant focus on resilience, and we intend to work with the City Council as we develop that. And as I said at the outset, we must also recognize that all our efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions are part of a resilience strategy. As I closed when we gathered to commemorate the anniversary of Hurricane Ida, I want to thank this Council for your ongoing attention to these critical issues. After 10 years of rebuilding and planning for more frequent and stronger storms, there is no question about the challenges and the transformative opportunities that lie ahead of us. We need to work together, thoughtfully, quickly, and by prioritizing the most vulnerable among us to act at the scale this climate emergency requires. My colleagues and I are happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I would like to emphasize that it's very important that today we have in New York City, even this, uh, the office, we have a chief climate officer, you know, because we didn't have it like in the last administration. So it's one more proof that this administration and this city council and this city takes this issue very, very seriously, that climate change and hurricanes and storms, 
uh, are not just uh, like one-time deal, you know, it's, it, it, we are facing this every day and it's gonna stay forever. So we need to, to be ready to work on this every day. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Council Member Riviera, Carr, Restler, Marte, Nurse, Gennaro, Ariola, Stevens, Won, uh, Paladino, Lee, and I would like to give a chance for opening statement to my uh, uh, co-chair of these hearings, uh, Council Member, uh, Majority Whip, uh, Sylvina Brooks Powers. Thank you so much, Chair. Good afternoon and welcome to this oversight hearing of the Committees on Resiliency and Waterfronts and Transportation and Infrastructure. This Saturday, October 29th, marks the 10th anniversary of Superstorm Sandy hitting New York City. During today's oversight hearing, the committees will examine where we as a city are in regards to rebuilding 10 years after the devastating impacts of Sandy. I am looking forward to co-chairing this hearing with my colleague, Chair Kagan, and thank him for his leadership on this issue. I know that the community he represents in Coney Island, including his beloved boardwalk, just like the area I represent in Far Rockaway, was devastated by Superstorm Sandy. And to this day, many parts have not yet fully recovered. It is my hope that after today's hearing, we will have a clearer and better understanding of what all levels of government are doing to make our community safer and more resilient. Superstorm Sandy unleashed havoc on the streets of the city and surrounding areas. The flooding caused by Sandy impacted the city greatly, with approximately 17% of the city's total landmass being flooded. Sadly, and more importantly, 44 New York City residents lost their lives as a result of the superstorm. Thousands of buildings, houses, and more suffered damage from the storm, which estimates that the storm caused, caused the city $19 billion in damages. In addition to residential and commercial property being severely damaged, the city's critical infrastructure and services took a major hit from Sandy. Close to 2 million customers of Con Edison, PSCNG, and LIPA lost power at some point during Superstorm Sandy, including myself. With Con Edison's steam system unable to service one third of its customers, for several weeks and flooding damage to facilities in southern Manhattan, Red Hook, and the Rockaways di disrupted landline and internet service for up to 11 days, and numerous hospitals, doctor offices, and medical facilities were forced to close due to flood flooding. To say the least, Superstorm Sandy wreaked havoc on the city, of which we are still trying to rectify. There are still some parts of my council district that are undergoing Superstorm Sandy construction activities and redevelopment and where homes are still being fixed. In addition to Superstorm Sandy, we are seeing an increasing number of storms making landfall in the United States. As New York City is particularly vulnerable to flooding related to sea level rise, storm surges and high tides, the city is particularly impacted by this increase. More active hurricane seasons have recently impacted the city, causing increased flooding, damage to commercial and residential property, large-scale impacts on critical city infrastructure, and above all, loss in human life, of which should never occur. Our city's waterfront communities face significant threats from extreme weather events and high tides, with these things only being exacerbated in the future due to continued sea level rise and the impacts of climate change. These threats have a disproportionate impact on low income and minority communities who often live in flood prone areas and those at higher risk for flooding from natural disasters. This is particularly distressing as communities such as mine and many others in the city face these effects. A study by climate experts estimates that over the next 300 years, there will be higher seas larger storm surges and more frequent intense hurricanes. That is why we must hold this hearing. We need to look at what the city has done in the past 10 years since Superstorm Sandy to ensure that we as a city are protected and are taking the most effective avenue to reduce the impacts of these storms on residents, property, and critical infrastructure. Superstorm Sandy, excuse me, 
and its impact on my district in particular has me interested today in hearing from the administration how they are preparing the city for the future storms regarding planning, construction, and resiliency projects. And as chair of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, I'm also looking forward to getting an update on the city's use of, or planned use of federal infrastructure funding, both from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act and from the Inflation Reduction Act to prepare the city for future storms and whether any of these funds have been committed to spe specific resiliency projects in the city and whether any federal dollars from FEMA were earmarked for resiliency along Jamaica Bay, what the status is of it and the timeline. I'm also interested in learning how the Department of Transportation interacts and coordinates with the Department of Environmental Protection and the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice on resiliency planning to ensure that flooding is mitigated via the streets and other areas that the Department of Transportation has purview over. Thank you, Chair Kagan. I now turn the hearing back over to you. Thank you so much, Chair Sylvina Brooks-Powers. And I would like to acknowledge three more council members who just joined us. Council members Williams, Farias, Yeager. <coughs> So I believe now it's time to ask questions to administration. Thank you. So the Resiliency and Waterfronts Committee held its first hearing about preparedness for storms and hurricanes in City Hall on April 11th of this year. What has the administration done in the past six months regarding planning, construction, and completion of resiliency projects? Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's been a busy six months, um, and I'll, I'll list a number of things that, that we've done and, and then perhaps uh, pull back to think about our overall approach. You know, number one is, as I mentioned this morning, we broke ground on BMCR um, and also the Howard Beach raised shoreline uh, started. We've made significant progress on uh, Esker, including in July, the, uh, the installation of the first major floodgate at uh, Asher Levy. Um, we've been working very closely with the Army Corps to get closer to the groundbreaking on the South Shore Staten Island project, which, as we know, is an, and as I said, is uh, tremendously important. Um, and then there's been a lot of uh, progress made in the Rockaways, um, as you know, including, unfortunately, some controversial construction that had to take place this summer, but nonetheless, it's an indication of the progress being made. In terms of planning, as I said, uh, the ha city's housing blueprint included, I think it's notable that a housing blueprint included an entire section focused on resilience, demonstrating that we think about this across multiple aspects of uh, city work. And in fact, I, I compliment Chief Housing Officer Jessica Katz for proactively seeking to include that and working closely with, with my team, with Kizzy's office and with others. Um, at DEP, of course, as you know, we, we did lead on rainfall ready in conjunction with MOCEJ, which speaks directly to our attempt to help uh, New Yorkers and homeowners why, during the near term while we do the work over the long term to reduce the likelihood of flooding that we indicated uh, through the vision we presented on September 1st on the Ida anniversary around how we will achieve long-term stormwater. Uh, we've continued our work on Flood Help NY, um, and there is ongoing work, uh, ongoing outreach around flood insurance. We've, we are in the process of expanding the Be a Buddy program, and there's a new uh, RFP that we have released for a new BAB site in Queens. Um, and as we announced today, we've launched uh, both the website that is in response to, to the local law and what we see as the logical extension of that, which is Climate Strong Communities, which will take the information in what uh, Local Law 122 required and use that as the basis for a series of community-based conversations that engage the community to figure out exactly how, on a neighborhood-by-neighborhood -neighborhood basis, we should realize um, climate resilience against, as I said, all of those hazards. And then finally, we have spent a significant amount of our time both working with the Army Corps on the HAT study and thinking about the sustainability, I mean, I'm sorry, the, uh, the resilience components 
of the city's uh, sustainability plan, which as you know by law, has to be updated every four years and is due out uh, this coming April. So it's been a busy, couple of, uh, a busy couple of months. I think there's been significant progress. And what I would urge you, and I, I thank you for, for acknowledging the fact that, that this administration has reintegrated resilience and climate work and brought in environmental justice as an equal component to that in the way we have restructured uh, the mayor's office under, under Kizzy's leadership. We've connected um, that climate policy with a major operating agency, which is the frontline agency, at least when it comes to stormwater in, in the form of my role as both DEP commissioner and chief climate officer. And I think with the housing uh, work, you see that we really are working to inject resilience thinking across every relevant aspect of city government. Thank you. Uh, my second question is related to community engagement because we often use the term community engagement, community input. So my second question is how this administration reached out to elected officials, community boards, community organizations, and the public during the planning for resiliency projects throughout the city before shovels are put to the ground? And even the programs announced today, like what is the community input? And same story with Army Corps of Engineers. It's a significant $52 billion. What is the community engagement here? Mm -hmm. Community boards, environmental groups. I spoke today at Waterfront Alliance, um, and uh, they all also asked me whether their opinion would be even like ask anybody will ask their opinion in general about any of these projects. Mm -hmm. um, well, let me just say uh, to start, and then I'll ask uh, my colleagues to, uh, to go in. Of course, we think that community engagement um, and listening to stakeholders is critical. Um, we, we know that there are several forums in which the city formally gathers that kind of input, including uh, the legally required appointment of a sustainability advisory board, which um, we'll have more to say on in, in the coming weeks and months. Um, at the same time, I think we all know, and, and I, I'll point out the great leadership of Council Member Rivera sitting here, that community engagement can be very intense, and you are still not going to have everybody be perfectly happy with the difficult challenges that we face. I mean, there is no way to escape the fact that climate change is going to cost us. It is going to cost us things that we like about our city, and things are going to have to change. And so we can't kid ourselves that community engagement leads to consensus. Community engagement is absolutely critical. Um, it is built into everything we do when it comes to planning, and I think our, our focus on climate strong communities demonstrates that but we, we can't pretend that we will reach consensus by simply engaging the community. Let me ask uh, Jordan to give some specifics on some programs and how we've engaged communities. Perfect, thanks, Rit. Um, so exactly right, um, and, and I think, uh, as, as mentioned in, in, in the testimony uh, and uh, the uh, mayoral announcement this morning, uh, these are unprecedented projects uh, and, and require uh, uh, of new levels of engagement uh, and kind of using new methods and new tools. Uh, did want to highlight a, a couple projects, uh, in particular the resilient uh, Edgemere Community Plan, a plan as a result of multiple years of community engagement and threads a challenging balance between new affordable housing opportunities, history of uh, neighborhood disinvestment, and increasing flood risk exposure, uh, and now is a, a, a model that, that, that we rely on uh, and, and will uh, build into our process moving forward. Also wanted to highlight uh, some of our work in, in Lower Manhattan. Uh, as many of you know, uh, the, uh, the, one of the projects contemplated in that area involves uh, extending the shoreline. Uh, this is a, a uh, you know, all these projects are, are, are complicated. Uh, this is uh, an, an additional level. Um, and so uh, this has involved walking tours, uh, uh, virtual reality, uh, and uh, a number of different tools that we employed uh, during COVID. Um, so it gives you a sense of a, a couple of different approaches that we've employed. Talking about transparency, because uh, very often communities asking questions that asking, including council members, that only you or mayor can answer. So uh, my question is about like specifically like web websites and web-based resources. Like you mentioned, program Adapt NYC, and today was announcement about climate strong communities. What information could be available to everybody, to all New Yorkers, so they can read more about your approach? 
Thank you for the question, uh, council member. Let me just be clear about what we mean by the web source. At the end, we are trying to provide information to New Yorkers and New Yorkers are overwhelmed by the amount of information that we provide to New Yorkers. Everybody wants a plan. You don't want a plan, actually. Nobody wants to sit through and read the 500 pages worth of it, another plan. What they actually want to hear about is how is it that we're keeping them safer? How, when is it that we're coming to their community to ask for their input and their feedback, right? They want to actually be able to see the work in action. And I think that that interactivity, <laughs> I, I know that's not a word, don't judge me, um, right? Like that interactive nature of being able to see and touch the work is actually what's really critical, which is why we think that another plan and another set of initiatives and pretending that the plan is the end goal is not a helpful tool. I'm a New Yorker too, lifelong New Yorker, and I know that what I really care about is to understand how many bioswells are coming to my neighborhood, right? When is the Rockaways uh, boardwalk going to be finalized, finished? So when, why not, to, exactly. put it, why so we, not to put it on the website? So what we're doing is trying to bring all of that work together. We have passed 10 years worth of policies, 10 years worth of plans. We've done a lot of progress, made a lot of progress on our initiatives. We wanted to put it in one place, and that's currently on the web, and we'll continue to improve. I'm not saying that it is perfect. I'm not saying it is beautiful. It will get there. We want to be able to show New Yorkers what's happening in their neighborhoods and have them understand the climate risks that they face and the strategies that their government and their taxpayer dollars are funding, right, in their areas. And so that's why ADAPT is a visual aid online. Nobody's asking about 500 pages on the website, no. Yeah. You can put interactive map neighborhood by neighborhood, what is the plan, so that's what we are talking about. That's right. Okay, now I would like to ask a few questions about NYCHA, but I, I don't know, do we have a representative? From? Yes, okay, good. We do. So it's not a secret that uh, NYCHA developments were damaged by Superstorm Sandy, and uh, as uh, in my district I have uh, so many housing developments and all this money even allocated after Superstorm Sandy. Until today, this Sandy re resiliency projects are still not done, not finished. So everybody's asking about timeline. Everybody's asking, do you need more money or you didn't use even existed money? So a few questions to NYCHA specifically. So are there any NYCHA reconstruction projects uh, uh, relative to Superstorm Sandy projects that are not completed yet? Hello, and thank you for having me. Uh, it was great to see you again. The last time I think I saw you was at the town hall down in Coney Island where we got to talk with a lot more specifics. I'm Joyce Cinderbrand, the Senior Vice President for Capital Programs at NYCHA, and I'm excited to say that after NYCHA got access to $3.2 billion in December of 2015, we've invested over $2.7 billion in developments across the city. These are not a one-piece project. So as you know, uh, we might be investing $100 million, $200 million, $300 million at a single development. And so because of that, what we're focused on is what benefits residents quickly. So for this hurricane season, NYCHA has 100 buildings across the city protected from storm surge, 10,000 apartments with full backup power, and 3,500 apartments that have new heat and hot water systems that are protected from future flooding. There certainly is more work to be done, but in Coney Island, we do have a, no a number of developments that are done and three construction projects that are still underway. I'm asking because every time I go to Haber Houses, for example, on West 24, it looked like this Sandy Resiliency Project will be like 50 years or, or maybe even more. Uh, local seniors were promised long ago everything will be over by 2018, 2020, 2022. And for example, they still cannot use their beloved senior center. And every time, okay, it's in a few months, and in a few years, you know, like so. That's why I'm asking, uh, like any timeline. So like uh, boilers, another very hot topic all over the city. Mm -hmm. How many new boilers were installed in NYCHA residences after Superstorm Sandy? And do we still have some work on, on boilers not done, not, not finished yet? Yes, as I said, we have 3,500 units that are served by new boilers, but altogether, the Sandy Recovery Program is replacing 20 heat and hot water systems across the city. Uh, and just for a second, I want to go back to Haber. We had a really productive call with the, the Senior Center in, in Difta just the other day. 
the Haber project is, is an over $50 million investment. It's, it's not a senior center renovation. It's putting in full backup power. It's putting in a new boiler system. It's putting in annex buildings to protect critical infrastructure. So we, we want to really emphasize that, that the impact to the senior center is very regrettable, uh, and we're hoping to get the physical completion done by the end of the year with permits and closeout in the next few months. Thank you. I would like to repeat again about boilers. So you said 3,500 new boilers were installed? No, no, sorry. 3,500 apartments, apartments. 3,500 units because, like, have, have new boiler systems in place, and that's at uh, eight developments. Uh, but we have 72 new boilers 72. in place, literally hoisted in place, and we're doing the connections, getting the gas on, getting all of the permits done. So we're, we're looking to have many more of those ready for the next heating season, um, and all of them complete by the end of 2023. Any boilers are still not installed after Sandy? We still have some? There are like no boilers that are not in place, but they're not all turned on and permitted at this time. Another question that is very often I hear from uh, NYCHA residents about resiliency. What resiliency measures were put in place in regards to the uh, landscape of NYCHA properties to prevent severe floodings in the future? Specifically for landscaping, and when we talk about passive protection, that's always the top priority. There, there's really just two kinds of, of storm surge protection you can put in. The, the passive kind works without intervention and deployables. A lot of NYCHA campuses are site constrained and are uh, we're not built in the 30s, 40s, and 50s to be retrofit, so they do have some deployables. On the largest campuses, Red Hook, Brook, Bayside, we were able to use landscaping style protections, and those are, uh, those are under construction right now. And again, this is ongoing problem, not just related to Sandy, but like, I remember basically elevators did not work after Sandy, mm -hmm. so, but I would say elevators do not work even without any Sandy in my chain, like so. But, uh, like any measures done that to, to prevent, at least in the future emergencies, that at least less elevators would be like un unworkable in case of future emergencies. By the end of the program, 200 of NYCHA's buildings will have full backup power generators, natural gas power generators installed. Some of these are being enrolled in demand response to, to help the neighborhoods around them um, hold the capacity. But in addition to that, NYCHA has uh, recently applied for a FEMA grant to put in voltage regulators on additional senior buildings to allow, um, to allow the, the elevators to continue working when there are voltage interruptions, then we're looking into piloting battery backup power as well. So there, there's a continued effort to expand what we've done in the city recovery program and take those best practices forward. So talking about funding, so as I understand about $3.2 billion in funding after Sandy for specifically for resiliency projects was allocated to NYCHA. So how much of this funding actually been spent and how long will it take to spend all of this money specifically for resiliency projects? So specifically for the Sandy Recovery Program, we've invested about $2.77 billion of the 3.26. Uh, some of the longest and largest projects are still under construction, partially because of the intense invasiveness of those landscaping-based protections and the site-wide distribution that goes to support new boilers, new generators, new electricity. And what neighborhoods are you talking about? Sure. So not the, finished. That are not finished, sure. So the, the longest projects, we have um, Red Hook East and West Houses. That's a, a $550 million total investment, and that's the largest in the program. Um, secondly, in your district, we have Coney Island Sites, which is O'Dwyer, Surfside, and Site 8. I believe we're at 60% uh, or 50% completion. Well. We did the roofs, 60% completion there. Um, so that's also one of the largest projects in the portfolio, and that's where we're combining that new resilient boiler room with the, the community center with the rooftop basketball court and garden. And the idea being we get money for a resilience benefit, but if we can spend $1 to do two things, to provide resilience but also provide an amenity to the residents, that's really a, a priority for us. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So, like, we already asked questions about local law 122, but one more time, uh, when are you going to deliver it basically to New York City Council more details, not just like in pieces, but more details about um, adaptation of local law 122? Um, Councilmember, thank you. We will forward you the link 
to our web resource, uh, which satisfies the requirements of the local law. Okay. But this is Army Corps. Okay. So, question about uh, New York, New Jersey Harbor and tributary studies. We will ask Army Corps of Engineers later, but like specifically to administration, the, the public comment period about the study is open until January 6, 2023. Does the administration uh, plan to submit its own comments? Uh, yes, we certainly will. Um, We're going to be taking our time, so I don't have a, an opinion to share today, but um, we certainly intend to, to offer our comments. Um, and I will point out that we have a very productive uh, collaboration with New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, who are the two uh, official non-federal partners in this. And, and I think it's very important that we are able to work together um, as the three local partners. And I remember when you visited Coney Island Boardwalk, by the way, thank you for visiting together with New York City Parks Commissioner. And we talked about how important is like, not just funding, but what is the share of New York City. And usually it's like, even if it's this funding finally materialized, it goes to the state. So the question is, how will the city fund its share of construction costs? Uh, well, I think, uh, you know, at, at First of all, the bulk of that will have to come from the city budget. Um, we would obviously be seeking whatever grants, whether it's from the state, uh, and we do know that there's an Environmental Bond Act on the ballot uh, here in New York in the next couple of weeks, so there may be further funding opportunities, but as we've seen with Eastside Coastal Resilience, when the city has a project that it needs, uh, we will pay our share, and we've done the same with, uh, with some of the other projects around the city. And another question was already was mentioned. Uh, most of the plans are like, even everything goes beautifully, you know, like, which is not, of course, but construction would not be completed until at least 2044. And like, what are the plans in the interim? You know, what plans are in place for the city to protect itself from storms and hurricanes while we are waiting for the Corps of Engineers to finish the construction? So it's a long period of time. It is a long period, and, and you know, I'll, I'll reiterate the point that I was making earlier, which is that um, even when, let, let us imagine that the tentatively selected plan is adopted exactly as the Corps has already proposed it, and it is fully funded, and it proceeds with lightning speed, and it is completed, I do not think we are going to be done with coastal resilience planning, right? I mean, as, as I said, I think we're going to have to accept the fact that resilience planning and investment is now going to be a permanent part of government. It's like saying, when will the Department of Education be finished with its job, right? It's never going to be finished. It's an ongoing task, right? Investment in transportation infrastructure. It's an ongoing task. So I think that will always be the case, particularly exacerbated by the fact that whatever we do now, we have to plan for scenarios. These projects take a very long time. The science continues to change, not anything about whether climate change is happening, but exactly what the impacts of climate change are going to be in what time frame. Our, our understanding is evolving. And so I think what we have to do, and, and this was very much what we were trying to do uh, this year, uh, speaking particularly on, on stormwater resilience, where rainfall ready was about the short-term things we do in the interim. right? Are they a fantastic fix? Of course not. But they help eliminate deaths, they help reduce property damage, those are the two things, to the best we can while we allow time for the longer term fixes to, to take shape. I think what Joy was talking about in terms of NYCHA informs a lot of NYCHA uh, and their investments. One aspect of it is how do we prevent flooding from taking place? Another is how do we build in the resilience that allows us to recover when a bad thing happens. You recover quickly if nobody dies. You recover quickly if equipment is turned off and out of service for 12 hours but isn't destroyed so it's out of service for a month or two months. So we have to do all of that and I think we, real, we will genuinely have to spend the rest of our lives planning both for the risks that we are not protected against and 
building the, the protections for the risks that will change and, emer and new risks emerge over time. By the way, but do you support this study? Do you support plan, federal plan, like what we read in newspapers and news and everywhere else? Well, look, again, the, the city will come out with its comments on the tentatively selected plan. Um, I, I think we certainly support the fact that this work is going on. We certainly support the fact that the Army Corps has a responsibility and the federal government has a responsibility to protect New York Harbor. Um, exactly the specifics, it's, it, to their credit, the Army Corps has done detailed analysis. Several of us actually spent uh, the bulk of a day um, over at the Army Corps getting briefed on many of the details. We will continue to, uh, to look into it. We also intend as the city not only to work closely with the state and with New Jersey, but we are also going to be listening very intently to what the New York City public has to say as part of the Army Corps' ongoing public uh, engagement on this issue, and we may wind up asking some questions of the public and other stakeholders ourselves. All of that will inform what the city says about the tentatively selected plan. And I will ask one more question related to waterfront areas all over the city of New York. This question is constantly asked about construction, homes, businesses, uh, in the areas that regularly flood now. How is the city addressing these equity issues in areas of high flood risk? Uh, what, are, what are the city's view, views on constructing homes and businesses in areas that will regularly flood? Five, 10, 20 years from now, this is a very important issue. Because uh, on one hand, we need housing, and then we need to, de to do development. On the other hand, we don't want to have a situation when we need to uh, face all, everybody is flooded in a, sh in a uh, shore front area, in a waterfront areas, you know, like it happened after Sandy. So how to well, make a proper balance? It's a, a really important question, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleague um, from uh, city planning in a moment, but I'll just say, I'll reiterate the fact Within this administration, we are engaging in questions about specific projects and those bigger trade-offs on a daily and weekly basis um, in conversations among my team and MOCEJ, the Department of City Planning, EDC, the Chief Housing Officer, HPD. This is a really big tension. It's a tension when it comes to coastal issues. It's a tension when it comes to inland flooding issues. Uh, it is going to be one of our key challenges. Um, we have to think about it at the big picture. We also have to think about it at the project by project level. Um, but it is something that is front and center uh, in our thinking. And, and let me ask uh, city planning to take over. Thank you. And thank you, Chair Kagan, for the question. To begin, it's perhaps worthwhile to look at the city's coastal and our flood risk across the, the 520 miles of waterfront that we face. There are roughly 400,000 residents living in today's flood zone as defined by FEMA, the 1% annual chance flood flood. That's the population of a good-sized American city, roughly that of Minneapolis. With 400,000 residents in the flood zone, the question isn't should we stop development or should we prohibit development in the flood zone? That question has been answered for now a couple hundred years. And so the question is what happens with new development in the flood zone? And new development in the flood zone is built to contemporary standards. Since Hurricane Sandy, we've updated our building code to make certain that buildings that are constructed today are far more resilient. And FEMA has shown this time and time again after every major hurricane in the United States, that building codes work. Buildings that are built to contemporary standards fare far better. That's not to say that there's no damage but that they fare far better as a whole than buildings that were built to older or, or even prior to standards. And this is important because in New York City, we are talking about a flood zone that is largely built out. And we are talking about not the development on greenfield sites, but redevelopment. Development that occurs today in the flood zone is largely replacing something else. And what that means is that the buildings that were there before were built before, uh, were to a lower standard, and the buildings that are being replaced, that are replacing them, are built to a higher standard. And that could make a huge difference. And we saw this throughout New York City during Sandy as well. And lots of examples of homes that were within blocks of each other, homes that were built prior to resiliency standards being knocked off their foundation, 
versus homes that were built to resilient standards where the homeowners or the residents can come back to those homes within a, within a day or two after the storm. Thank you. So the next question is related to New York City Controller Sandy report. So my question is, how is the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice working to better coordinate with agencies on their spending on resiliency projects, especially as the city receives more funds in the future? Well, let me start by saying, you know, first of all, I, I think we, we welcome the controller's report. Uh, overall, I think it was a, a, a detailed and, and generally speaking quite fair analysis. What it demonstrates kind of as, as what I was saying in my testimony is that there were some aspects of the funding that was received that were spent very fast, right? The easiest things when you're talking about immediately repairing damage that was done working at a single building level, that is work that can proceed very quickly. And those categories of funding, uh, what you saw in the, in the controller's report, are 96, 97, 98% uh, spent. So the things that were fast were done fast. The things that are lagging, uh, I'd argue, may not really be lagging so much as they just take a very long time. You look at a massive project like Eastside Coastal Resilience, um, that is a project that spent many years, pretty much eight years of the last 10, in consultation and design and pre-work. It started construction uh, months ago, not years ago, and a big project like that will spend the first 10% of its money in several years, and then the final 90% of its money in two or three years through, due to the construction phase. And I think that's the profile that we've seen. Now, we do know that there are a number of issues related to how federal grants work. Um, we've made some recommendations for streamlining those. As I mentioned, the, the Mayor's Capital Projects Task Force has a number of recommendations for how we in the administration, the controller's office, uh, and the state uh, government could help speed up projects, and we are working, again, closely with the controller uh, to do that. So there's a, a big focus on, on ensuring that we are moving as quickly as possible. And then finally, there are a number of components that, of funding, including funding at my own agency, DEP, which the controller's office identified as being underspent. Two things I'd point out about that. One is that while we know that Sandy was 10 years ago and we think about the, the Sandy funding, it's easy to imagine that this funding has been sitting around for 10 years. DEP got some federal post-Sandy money that arrived in 2018. So this is not all money that, are, that landed on our desks in 2013 and we've been sitting around. There's money that, now 2018 is not yesterday, so there's, a, a, there's some time there. But what we also see is that DEP and other agencies, in many cases, has chosen what I think is largely a responsible approach, although there's an opportunity for us, and I think the controller's office report will lead us to take another look at. Um, but in general, we'd often made the decision to incorporate this Sandy money into ongoing projects. And I will give you the, the example of the controller's office cited a significant amount of money as yet unspent at DEP. Again, this was not 2013 money, this was 2018 money. But for example, one pot of that money, $113 million, was for replacing electrical conduits and other electrical equipment at our wastewater treatment plants, many of which, as you know, did get flooded during Sandy and suffered damage. We chose to incorporate that work into ongoing state of good repair projects at those treatment plants because we decided it did not make sense to replace a lot of electrical cables when two or three years later, we were also going to be replacing large chunks of the overall equipment and would probably simply be tearing out that new electrical equipment that we had just put in. So some of this is actually being staged quite intentionally. I think it is a legitimate question, one I'm certainly asking within my agency to take another look, make sure that we are not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good and not overly delaying those but I think some amount of a long-term spend can reflect smart capital planning and not delay. Let me ask, since you mentioned MOCEJ, let me ask if Kizzy has anything yeah. else to add. Thank you, Rit. I just wanted to add that one thing that is really critical for this administration is that coordination piece, right? And so I just wanted to, to spend a moment to talk about that because even 
before the Sandy funding is fully spent. What we're actually trying to do is smart capital planning so that every dollar that we're spending is doing multiple things, is helping us to meet environmental sustainability goals so we're not wasting money, is helping us meet multiple climate hazards, not just storm, and it's helping us also plan for the next generation of things, right? So I think one of the key uh, uh, approaches that we're taking, as, as you know, Red and I are, are partners in this in, in this struggle, um, is look behind us. This is our brain trust. There used to be a time, and I was here for this, when sustainability wasn't really a thing that every agency did, right? Councilmember Gennaro, you were here for this too. Nowadays, years later, post Plan YC, almost every single city agency has a sustainability lead, has a sustainability office, has resiliency staff. They're here. This is our brain trust. These are our partners. These are the folks that every week come together with Rit and I to do that coordination, to really think through here are the updates, and maybe the update is something small. This is happening. We're announcing this thing. Maybe the thing actually comes up and says, Here's a dumpster fire we have going on, and then we have an offline conversation. So we're doing that weekly convening of our brain trust to ensure that we are aligned on purpose. And what is the purpose? To keep New Yorkers safe, to make our neighborhoods better, but also to do things faster and try to become a little more nimble, even as we're all exhausted from every single storm and every single uh, climate emergency that we continue to face. So that's our role. We take it very seriously. We're trying to make sure that we're coordinating across so that the federal funding that is coming, the state funding that might be coming, so that we're ready. We, we want to remain in a sta state of readiness. And I think we're doing an okay job with that. Yeah, guys? Eh. <laughs> it's a long call every week. Thank you. Talking about coordination, you remember, Commissioner, when you came to Coney Island Boardwalk, I asked you how it's going to be coordination between in New York City and uh, Army Corps of Engineers, so it will not be double uh, work uh, to replace the boardwalk, then to d d d do the demolition and to do another in, in five years or seven years. So do you coordinate everything, you know, like work with federal partners? And you said it's gonna be coordination. And we didn't want uh, taxpayers' money to be spent twice on the same project. That's right. Yes. Okay, okay. I would like to give a chance to, uh, to to ask questions to my esteemed colleagues. By the way, we were joined also by Council Member Narcisse. So the, I would like uh, to give a chance to ask questions to my uh, co-chair uh, of these hearings, uh, Chair of Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, uh, Majority Whip, uh, Council Member Sylvina Brooks-Powers. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will start with questions around post-Sandy FEMA funding. So the New York City Comptroller re released a report on October 13th regarding Sandy-related re resiliency spending. The report details how the city has failed to spend a large share of its $15 billion in federal grant money, even 10 years after the storm. The Department of Transportation's $142.3 million in FEMA funds have been earmarked for projects, but only 47% 47% of the funding has been spent. On which projects will this funding be utilized and what has delayed the spending of the FEMA funding? Let me just uh, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before I turn it over to my colleague from DOT for the specifics, I'll just reiterate uh, kind of this overall couple of points. Number one, we, we should not imagine that all post-Sandy money has been sitting around since, since 2012. Um, much of it came in in 2015, 2016, 2018. Um, in many cases, the, the, what has not been spent is the construction money. And of course, we know that for major projects, design takes many years. Um, and in a number of cases, uh, this money has been, um, to Chairman Kagan's point, wisely coordinated with other planned capital spending so as not to either be redundant or to be wasteful. And I think that's going to be true for DOT, it's true for DOT, uh, for DEP, it's true for a number of agencies. But, probably. Madam Chair, great to see you. Um, that's right, and I just want to provide a bit more context as well. DOT received about $800 million, not just from FEMA, but from our several state partners and federal partners, FHWA, this is the Federal Highway Administration, Federal Transit Administration, 
and of course the CDBG HUD funding. Um, total, we, we have spent um, about 68% of the money we've received, but I think what the commissioner was mentioning, the obligated um, uh, amount is what really matters here, and that's over 80%. Uh, just to give you an example of how we've spent the FEMA um, money that we've received and FHWA, I think when, Hunt, when Sandy hit, um, about half of our movable bridges, 12 out of the 24, were damaged, and those were already repaired. It was a massive, massive undertaking, um, but together with, with the team, uh, DOT, the administration, OMB, and everyone got together to make sure that the funding was there, and it was allocated, and it was spent down to make sure that those bridges um, uh, came back to the condition, that, that pre-Sandy condition. Thank you for that. Chair, I apologize. I just need to swear in the rest of admin since you're coming up. I apologize for that. So anyone, just all of admin, for the possibility that you might answer a question, just raise your right hand, please. Do you aff That's a lot of you. Do you, <laughs> <laughs> do you affirm to tell the truth in answering honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, just one follow-up question. Sure. How are you all prioritizing like the money as it's coming in and where to spend it? It's really project by project. Some projects have multiple grants with multiple agencies involved, so it really depends on the project. If, if you would like a briefing on just our f general federal grants project, we would love that. We have a lot going on right now. I, I, the bipartisan infrastructure law is a great example of just how complicated the grant process is. And we use it to fill in city tax levy, for example, whenever we can uh, and whenever we get those federal dollars. But it really depends on project by project. I um, would love to have that briefing, especially on District 31, of course. Of course. Um, so just moving on to the IIJA funding. In previous testimony, DOT called on the state to allocate 30% of new federal formula funds to mm -hmm. the New York City, with 15% to state assets and 15% to city assets. Has DOT received guidance on how new federal formula funds will be allocated? Yeah, and this is actually a conversation that we have with our federal partners and state partners on a daily basis. I think um, we would like to see that 30%. That's what we're all miss aiming for in terms of federal grants. Um, but it is a coordination, and it is something that we work on every day. Our grants team uh, and our state team and our IGA team are working together. I think we have a really good relationship with the state, and uh, you know we, we always want more. Uh, but I think they've been very receptive recently, especially with the grants um, that are coming in from the federal government. And has DOT received guidance on how new federal formula funds will be allocated? So what, what's that conversation that's happening? Sure. I wish I could give you a, a straight answer. The, the real answer is really depends by allocation. I think the grant amounts that we get from the federal government all have different stipulations. So it, it's unfortunately not a, an easy 30% of everything the state gets comes to New York City as we wish it were. Um, and so what's the status of the distribution of the actual dollars? So it really depends on the grant. So for example, the, the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, we've been applying to every type of grant and every type of um, NOFO, the, the notice um, that the federal government has put out on projects that they're taking applications. Um, each stipulation has different percentages, different city matches, different state matches. So it, it really depends on project by project the amount of money that we get um, from our state uh, partners, that f uh, those federal dollars that are flowing through the state. S there are some grants um, that do come directly to New York City, um, but those are rare in between. And does DOT expect the federal funds to be dis um, Excuse me, does DOT expect that federal funds will displace allocated city resiliency funds or will it supplement them? So it depends if the project is fully funded, which some of our, most of our projects uh, certainly in the short term are. Um, those will be displaced in city tax levy dollars, which is a great way to, to make sure that we are using those federal dollars. Um, if the project is not fully funded, then, though, then the federal grants would fill in those gaps. 
Okay. And um, the IIJA adds resiliency improvements to the list of allowable uses for National Highway Performance Program funds, the largest source of federal highway formula funding. Does DOT plan to utilize federal formula funds for resiliency improvements? If so, what kinds of improvements will this money fund and where? So the short answer is yes, absolutely. I think resiliency is on top of mind of every big project that we do. Um, the council last year uh, passed the design resiliency guidelines, which have been very, and I'm looking at Jessica, um, which have been a, just a great um, resource for the city in our capital projects to make sure that we incorporate resiliency factors into every big project that we have. Just to give you an example, and, and we're in a pilot phase, but we're very, very excited to see where this program takes us. Um, Harper Street um, administration building, um, the reconstruction of Shore uh, Road Bridge, uh, Mid Staten Island Blue Belt. Uh, these are all projects that we are incorporating the design resiliency guidelines, um, and we're very excited to see where that takes us and how we can take, incorporate resiliency into everything that DOT does and everything that the administration does as well. Um, thank you. And now going on to federal grant programs. In testimony before the committee this spring, DOT indicated that it had secured two new resiliency planning grants. Pool Corridor is a proposal funded by a FEMA Building Resilient, Infra Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant mm -hmm. that would help DOT plan for heat mitigation measures in the right of way and funding through the local waterfront revitalization program to adapt waterfront streets to sea level rise. Mm -hmm. Can you provide us with an update on these grants and has DOT received the funding for these programs? Yes, and I believe you're talking, so there are two um, awards that we've received on, based on the bipartisan infrastructure law. One of, them, one of them was for planning purposes, was $1.6 million for the East River bridges, and the other was, uh, in conjunction with our ADC partners, $7.25 million for uh, the planning of um, the New York City Greenway expansion plan. Those are the two recent grants that we've received. Um, it does take a while for us to receive the money. However, the planning is underway, um, and whenever we do get that money, we usually switch it out from city tax levy to those federal grants. Okay. Um, next, I'm going to pivot to flooding. The Comptroller estimates that 79% of the city's transportation and utility infrastructure lies in the 100-year floodplain. What is DOT doing to protect this infrastructure? Yeah, I, that's a great, great question. I think making our infrastructure resilient is, is really top of mind and top priority for this administration. Um, so DOT factors all the resiliency risk uh, associated with sea level rise, coastal inundation, and of course the increased heat into our capital designs. Um, we have several large projects that are um, that we're doing right now that, that are taking this into account. Um, we have a massive, the, the Battery Park West Street underpass, floodgates is something that um, we are, it's, it's a critical infrastructure that we are making resilient. Um, flood proofing the Whitehall and, and St. George Ferry terminals was also a massive project. And I mentioned the climate resiliency design guidelines, and I'm going to keep mentioning them because that was those were groundbreaking policy that the city uh, adopted uh, to make sure that every type of project that we move forward has that, these resiliency guidelines. Um, I, I do want to point out, though, that that 79 percent, um, not all of, all of it falls entirely on the city. There are some airports, um, highways, and other um, infrastructure, critical infrastructure. Um, uh, assets that do not fall under under the city jurisdiction. Is there any coordination that's happening in those instances? Yes, absolutely. And what does that look like? So we have monthly meetings with the Port Authority. We have monthly meetings with our state partners where we talk about all these projects to make sure that you know they aren't doing there aren't duplicating efforts. And of course, we are coordinating. Sometimes there's funding agreements that we go through. Um, so yes, absolutely. Um, how does the emer excuse me the administration decide whether to use green infrastructure or gray infrastructure strategies to mitigate the risk of flooding during intense rain events? And how do you determine which areas should be prioritized for such investments? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's an important question, um, and obviously the answer is in many ways that we are going to be using both in, in most places. Um, as we discussed and as the mayor laid out on the 1st of September, our overall vision for stormwater management around the city is to rely on our gray infrastructure, our sewer system, for that first 1.75 inches per hour of rain. So the 98% of all rainfall that's going to uh, hit the city even going forward is going to be storms that are less intense than that level. And so to do that, we have to, bless you, we have to make sure that that, that system is working fully we have to make sure that it is well maintained. And there may be some parts of the city, of course we know that in Southeast Queens, a couple of parts of Staten Island, et cetera, um, that system does not exist. As you well know, we are investing uh, billions of dollars in building out the storage infrastructure in Southeast Queens, lots of money in Staten Island uh, to, to get that gray infrastructure to where it needs to be. Beyond that intensity of 1.75 inches per hour, we believe we have very little choice but to rely on green infrastructure. As you know, the Blue Belt program has been tremendously successful, both in terms of managing stormwater and in terms of its public appeal. It's treated as an amenity. It has benefits to the transportation infrastructure, often that goes alongside it. Uh, and as we announced on September 1st, DEP is now undertaking uh, a, a citywide strategy for where Blue Belts might go. To date, we've considered Blue Belts really on an opportunistic basis. And we now are taking the perspective of saying, well, let's look at the map of the whole city. Let's look at the topography. Let's look, importantly, at where waterways were in the past that were covered over um, and built upon. And let's develop a citywide approach for where blue belts ought to go. Um, and then that is, of course, complemented by rain gardens, which have a significant uh, uh, benefit to this. Um, we have, as you know, 11,000 rain gardens around the city. We are certainly working on where they might go to date. Rain gardens have only been focused in a set of neighborhoods where we had agreed a decade ago with the State Department of Environmental Conservation that they would have an impact on reducing combined sewer overflow. I think that's an important point, that rain gardens thus far were part of a CSO strategy, not part of a stormwater mitigation strategy. We are changing our approach to that. We are, in fact, also in discussions with the state about how we might work together to change our perspectives on, on where rain gardens go and really embrace the idea that they are part of a citywide stormwater management strategy. And then, of course, the final component that the mayor announced or, or described on September 1st is cloudburst infrastructure. Of course, that was something that was discussed in the New Normal Report under the previous administration, and in fact, DEP had been working on cloudburst infrastructure as far back as 2016. We will be uh, breaking ground on our first cloudburst infrastructure this coming year. We're very excited about a project in the South Jamaica houses that, that was done with intense planning um, and workshopping with local neighborhoods. We also, in that project, had advice through a partnership with the city of Copenhagen, Denmark, where we are uh, using the experience that they had of developing sunken basketball courts and other, other public areas that become stormwater infrastructure. We are in the process of, of planning, as was committed in the New Normal Report. We will be identifying 10 neighborhoods where we will do the planning. We have enough budget to do four uh, of those neighborhoods over the coming several years. And I firmly expect that our cloudburst strategy will expand as we get a little smarter about how it works. And then finally, I'll conclude, Madam Chairman, by pointing out that last summer we also released, as part of Rainfall Ready, the map of where flooding due to rainfall is most likely to occur. That informed, for example, the stormwater barrier giveaways uh, that DEP undertook where we offered 15,000 homeowners around the city these inflatable barriers as a stopgap measure. Um, but it is also now going to be worked into the way DEP prioritizes its stormwater investments. Now that we have this data, we can target investments based on where we expect the flooding most to take place. I'm not going to tell you that all of our capital plans have already been shifted into conformance with that. We're also not going to make the, what I would consider a counterproductive step of stopping projects that are already designed or otherwise 
um, might not prioritize those areas, but it is certainly my intention that over the next year or two, our capital plans will be driven by the data. Thank you. I'm going to close my questions with build it back questions. So um, I wanted to know how many contractors are still owed money for completed build it back work and how is build it back addressing ongoing maintenance on properties it worked on such as leaks or defective construction on my way here part of my delay was visiting a couple of my constituents homes um, where their construction of their homes from build it back which was completed right at the start of the pandemic um, resulted in them missing, I guess, the window for the warranty to resolve some of the leakage that's been happening as a result. And so I'm really interested in hearing how the program is working to address these type of issues as well. But first, I'd like to know how many contractors are still owed money and how much money is owed. Sure. Uh, for, for those specific details, I'd have to get back to you. Uh, there are, construction is uh, complete and we're basically doing the final closeout of the program, final audits and payments to uh, the contractors and to close the contracts. Um, as far as any homeowner that would have an issue, like you mentioned, every, anything that build it back did came with a year warranty. Um, if you have a specific homeowner that has an issue that might have gotten lost in the pandemic, certainly just send them to us and we can we can track that down for you and, and review it. But there is a, a process that's still in place where the homeowner can call customer service and request repairs. Um, and you know we still have the capability to send someone out to the house and check and make sure to see what's going on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair Brooks. Uh, Powers, I, I, I would like to give a chance to ask a few questions to my colleagues. First one is uh, Council Member Restler. Thank you so much, Chairs Kagan and Brooks Powers, for leading uh, this hearing. Uh, it really couldn't be more important. Uh, I'd like to just use my time today uh, as a to talk about um, my wife's family, or really my family. Um, ten years ago this Saturday, we lost Jesse Strikecast and 43 other New Yorkers, including Jake Sikowitz, who she was walking with that, that, that day um, when tragedy struck. There's been, in my opinion, too much focus on property damage, which, of course, you know, can be fixed, and not enough on the lives that we've lost. Jesse was technically my wife's cousin, but she was really more like a sister. They were born months apart. They grew up in the same household in Ditmas Park. I actually knew Jessie before I had met Anna. Uh, she was just an extraordinary spark plug. Uh, we met when she was working on the 2010 AG campaign, Attorney General campaign, as the Brooklyn organizer, and she was somehow at every club meeting, at every organizing event, um, mobilizing all of Brooklyn, what felt like single-handedly. You know, every year, the family gathers, we gather with friends on Zoom, we gather on the block in Ditmas where, where tragedy struck. But it feels like the city forgets um, about these people who, who we lost. And the families don't forget. But I really wish that we could do more to recognize these New Yorkers who had so much more to give. And I know that if Jesse was still with us, she would be an an activist on many fronts, but especially around climate change, where clearly we are, are not doing anywhere near enough. Um, and so I, I, I just want to ask the question of what is this administration going to do to remember the people we lost? 
Council Member, thank you for, uh, for that. And, and of course, uh, personally, and I'm sure on behalf of the mayor, I can say we're, we're very sorry for, for your family's loss. Um, I will tell you, I think it's a very good question um, in terms of how we institutionally commemorate them. Uh, this morning, we did have a, a moment of, of silence at the beginning of the mayor's event, uh, recognizing the fact that while we were there to um, break ground on an event, uh, announce a new program, um, and talk about the future, we also had to remember those 44 people. Um, and so uh, Deputy Mayor Joshi led us in a, in a moment of silence, and, and, uh, and all 44 were remembered in that way. But I think it's a, a worthwhile question, and one that I'd, I'd be happy to engage with you personally on. Um, well, I, I know that Jesse's family, especially her mom, Fran, and her brother, Jake, my partner, Anna, and her dad, Steve, you know, that would be very meaningful. So thank you. Thank you. So following up on uh, Councilmember Ressler's uh, story, I would like to have a moment of silence in memory of all victims of Superstorm Sandy and all hurricanes and storms. Moment of silence, please. Thank you very much. Every life is precious, and of course, we lost uh, many lives after during Superstorm Sandy. And one of the reasons why we're hosting these hearings, and this is very important work, because again, like it's, we're talking about lives, we're talking about livelihood of this beautiful city. So it's very, very important work. So I would like to give a chance to ask question to Council Member Gennaro. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank Councilman Ressler and the, and the chair uh, and, and the commissioner for, um, you know, giving this hearing a sense of, you know, humanity and poignancy, and uh, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, this is, uh, um, you know, this I'm going to be telling to the panel, but also a note to the committee council. This is kind of like a housekeeping item, so to speak. Uh, you know, we're going to go back in time a ways. This is a law that was written pre-Sandy, Local Law 42. Yeah, I'm, the grins on the other side of the table because they knew this was coming. Um, <clears throat> now, this was a law that was drafted and passed in a different era. This is before Sandy. Um, this is before we even had an Office of Resiliency within OLTPS, which did not get created until... Um, whenever I created it in 2013. So this is 2012, Local Law 42 of 2012, pre-Sandy, uh, uh, pre-Sandy. So the question before I even get into it is, you know, whether or not this still works in the current environment, but it's still on the books. We have to figure out like how to comply with it or change it or whatever. And um, before I cast any aspersions, I think the only aspersion to be cast would be on on me because when I came back to the council, um, I had forgotten about it. And um, I was one of the co-primes on Local Law 122 of 2021, and that should have lit a f spark in me to think about what he had done years ago. So Local Law 42, I'm gonna read a little bit from it, and then uh, and I think the fallout from this will be for you know the council to this committee and the council uh, um, overall, uh, and also the administration on how we go forward, being that this is on the books. Um, so this talks about the uh, intent of the law. The council finds that in order to prepare for and mitigate the expected impact on climate change in New York City's communities, vulnerable population. When I put the New York City panel on climate change together, I thought I would give it a broad mandate. So it's New York City's communities, vulnerable populations, public health, natural systems, critical infrastructure, buildings, and the economy to help fulfill the goals of Plan YC 2030 and on and on. So that was the intent, the actual language that talks about the task force, and I'm watching the clock here. Uh, there should be a New York City Climate Change Adaptation Task Force consisting of city, state, federal agencies, and private organizations and entities responsible for developing, maintaining, operating, and overseeing the city's public health, natural systems, critical infrastructure, 
Okay, fine. Um, and the task force shall be chaired by the Office of uh, Long-Term Planning and Sustainability and shall include, but need not be limited to, representatives from DOB, Depar uh, DDC, uh, city planning, environmental protection, parks, sanitation, transportation, economic development corporation, emergency management, on and on, you get the idea. Uh, and also representatives from organizations in the healthcare, communications, energy, and transportation fields who shall be appointed to and serve at the pleasure of the mayor without compensation by the city. Uh, and the mayor shall appoint the appropriate federal, state, and local agencies to authorize uh, to participate. And it talks about how often they would meet, you know, uh, twice a year, and the whole, I, I don't, don't want to read the whole thing. Um, but it's very, very detailed. Uh, and so the, um, so the question is that this is on the books right now. This is the way, th this was pre-Sandy, pre, -Sandy, pre um, uh, uh, you know, brain trust, you know, how we go forward and try to map out, you know, the Yellowbrook Road to like the Oz of, you know, you know, great sustainability and um, climate change adaptation and resilience. So um, with that said, we have this on the books and we either have to comply with it, make it fit somehow, or we have to you know, make an amendment to it so that it works better in the current environment. Um, and so that, and I, I got 28 seconds left. And so, um, uh, 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 Commissioner, anything you might have to say on this? Oh. Or Kizzy, or uh, whatever. Yeah, go ahead, Kizzy. Thank you for that. Um, Council Member Gennaro, what we did with this piece of legislation back then was legislate meetings that would bring together the various actors that needed to come together at that time to really envision what sustainability and resiliency should be for the years to come. I would argue we have done that. We continue to do that. The task force meets. Is it called the task force? Has that evolved over time? What are the sets of activities that these particular players have every day now to meet the actual intent of the legislation. So let me tell you about that. The CCATF officially met for the last time, officially, on November 8th of 2021. It continues to meet. We continue to coordinate and give briefings between the New York City panel on climate change and these set of stakeholders. Many of them are sitting here. Many of them we talk to every week. Let me give you an example, Con Edison, key partner at the time, in 2008, we thought we had to drag them, right, to a meeting every six months to talk about the sustainability agenda for 2030. Now, Con Edison, just like every agency on this panel, right, has its own sustainability strategy, its own resiliency strategy, has invested billions of dollars, over a billion dollars in resiliency. I would say that is a job well done. So we continue that coordination, but now we talk to Con Edison every week, as opposed to the mandated every six months, and we're still doing that. So I would argue that absolutely we need to do something with what's in the books, and whether we call it a task force, whether we call it here our appointees, that's a different story, but I want you to know that we take this very seriously. We know that it takes every level of government, it takes the private sector, it takes every single one of these agencies here to do this work well, to institutionalize sustainability, and we have done that. And I think a great example of that is we've, you've had all the plans. You had Plan YC 1.0, Plan YC 2.0, you had one NYC, two versions of that. You'll have a new Plan YC coming out in April, and these are the, the plan will be courtesy of the Adaptation Task Force, <laughs> the CCATF. Well, I'm, 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 I'm certainly uh, uh, happy to hear that, just to put a capstone on your good testimony. And uh, don't think, Mr. Chairman, that I don't notice the fact that you give me a little bit of latitude here, and I, and I do appreciate it. Uh, I, I, I would welcome an opportunity, you know, to be briefed more in detail along with my, you know, along with the council to this committee to make sure that 
um, uh, um, compliance in the eyes of the council has been achieved because we have no problem changing it. Sure. You know, so I, I, I think we should just do that, and I think and kumbaya. You know, love it. If, if I could, council member, and I, I think we'd be very happy to work with you and and the chair and and the committee council to think about how both local law 42, local law 122, what their successor should be recognizing the fact that this is a much more established approach and incorporating um, kind of this observation that resilience is going to be uh, an ongoing process, right? And, uh, and we'll, we'll work together. That's fine. I'm just a little stickler about the letter of the law, which I have no problem changing. Absolutely. So um, this was great. I'm going to celebrate this uh, exchange with a, uh, a Reese's. I'm going to, that's what I'm going to do. You have to okay. share, Councilman. Hey, I only got one. I'm sorry. On. I, 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 I stole it from the Speaker's, I, I, I borrowed it from the Speaker's office. Thank you. Uh, 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 thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for the, for the latitude and the indulgence, and thank you for your good answer. Thank you, Councilmember Gennaro, and I would like to give a chance to speak to Councilmember Nurse. Thank you, Chairs. Um, thank you to the panel. I really appreciate all the information that's being downloaded today. It's so much. Um, in fact, you've answered almost all of my, you've answered all my questions, um, which is really great and very rare in a hearing. Um, I guess what's really challenging is for most of us how we communicate this to the people we represent, um, who are going through these impacts in real time, who didn't have flood insurance and now are stuck with bills and figuring out what to do and getting constant, uh, anytime a, a heavy storm comes, you know, we're all like on edge, are we gonna get calls the next day? And so I understand the enormity of these, these projects um, as a former construction worker, as some, the daughter of a naval engineer, my mother worked for Army Corps of Engineers in the past, like I understand and fully appreciate these things take time. I guess if you could just explain to me, like, I'm a resident, you know, what can we do to make things go faster? What is it? It sounds like there is a, a big chunk of money in place, but do we need more t contractors who can do this work? Do we need more workers? Like, what, what are, like, the things that concretely we can say, this would make these projects move faster? This is what the city needs to do to build the capacity to move this stuff. In particular, if you're saying, and rightly saying, and I appreciate you saying that this is something we are going to now constantly have to be doing, constantly be reassessing, have to be nimble on, um, and it is going to forever be costly because these are major public works projects. So what, what is it that I can turn around and say to the people that I represent who are getting these new cloud bursts, whatever we're calling them now, um, that we can do? Uh, thank you, Council Member. Um, I, I think there are two aspects to the answer that I'd, I'd share. Number one is is we have to we have to make all of our capital work go faster. As I mentioned in my testimony, first Deputy Mayor Grillo and, and Controller Lander uh, jointly in a in a wonderful example of of cooperation have been working on this list of things. The the report came out a couple of weeks ago. With an, with an initial agenda of things that the administration can do, the controller can do, and we need the state legislature to do to streamline capital projects of all types. Um, and as I've said, as Kizzy pointed out as well, our resilience work, there aren't three kinds of resilience project, right? There are 25 kinds of resilience projects, right? And, and so much of what all of these agencies are doing. So it's basically we have to speed up all of our capital work. I can tell you, I think I've told you personally as well in the past, as Chief Climate Officer, I think the work that I'm trying to do as DEP Commissioner to accelerate DEP's own procurement is actually one of the most important things we could be doing for stormwater resilience. Because leaving aside what we build and where we build it, we're not going to be able to build it if we can't get the money out the door, if we can't get the contracts out the door, if we can't evaluate the RFPs, if we can't get the negotiations done. Right. So there's something about improving the metabolism um, a lot of that is on us. Uh, I, I would say you should be asking us constantly about the speed of our procurement. You should be asking us constantly about the turnaround time, about how much of our capital project, our capital budgets we've committed. Those are the questions I ask my team on a weekly basis. 
Um, I, as the mayor pointed out this morning, a critical innovation that would be hugely advantageous is if the state allows the city to embrace progressive design build. It's worth noting that during the pandemic, because of the states of emergency that were declared by the mayor and by the governor, DDC actually did significant work using progressive design build and realized some of the big successes of construction that, that took place during that period. The state uses progressive design build. The entire public sector uses, I mean private sector, uses progressive design build. The state does not legally allow us to use progressive design build and what progressive design build means is that you can bid out a contract um, before the final design is complete, which actually means you are excavating, you are looking at what's under the ground with your contractor before designs are, are undertaken. And so that shaves off time. It also reduces the number of change orders because as we all know, you start work, you always find stuff you didn't expect to be there. Now you'd be discovering it jointly with your contractor. The other thing I will say is that New Yorkers have lived in a luxurious climate. We have lived in a place that is generally quite safe. It is no longer safe. And every New Yorker now needs to be more conscious of the fact that he and she needs to protect themselves, right? We have to pay attention to the weather. We should not be going out when there are dangerous conditions. We should not be ordering the burrito and making somebody bring it to us in dangerous conditions. We have to plan ahead to protect our property, both institutionally, as I mentioned, in terms of flood insurance, and physically, which again is why DEP and, and other agencies were working to raise awareness and in those cases give away things like inflatable flood barriers. Thank you, um, Chair, if it's okay. I lied, I actually do have another question, I'm sorry. Um, just in terms of energy resiliency, um, the Federal Inflation Reduction Act has further incentivized renewable energy, particularly in disadvantaged communities, um, and now allows public and tax exempt entities to access solar initiatives or incentives. Has the city begun to analyze how this new law can support efforts and reduce the cost of building solar on public buildings, public schools, and public land? Um, thank you for the question. Um, the answer is yes. And let me just say something about Climate Strong Communities, which is the initiative we launched today, which I really want us to just take away from this hearing, that we're really thinking about resiliency beyond coastal protection, right? That flood wall is not appropriate everywhere. It's not wanted everywhere. But resiliency really means multiple layers, right? <laughs> multiple approaches, and solar is one of those things. Renewable energy is one of those things. Flood insurance is one of those things. Not paving over your drive, <laughs> your, your driveway is one of those things. That water has to go somewhere, right? So when you asked the question earlier, um, council member, about what can New Yorkers do and say, ultimately the thing that we're trying to convey to everyone is we need an all hands on approach to how we're going to keep each other safe, how we're going to protect our property, but also most importantly, even if the thing is expensive, right? The most expensive thing is loss of life, right? The most expensive thing is to do nothing and then to experience that flooding, flooded basement because we didn't want to invest in the backwater valve situation or we thought that the solar panel was too expensive or we didn't want to tap into the confusing amount of paperwork that NYSERDA or Con Edison have for the incentive programs. What we're saying as a city is we're trying to put it all together so that New Yorkers can access, right, the incentive programs. We can provide that technical assistance that can help homes become more sustainable but also more resilient to climate hazards. So I think that energy democracy is a big part of that, ensuring that not just, that, that no one is sitting in their apartment baking in the heat in a heat wave, afraid of turning on that air conditioner for the two minutes that will help their body cool down before they die. It, it was a fully preventable death, right? Mm -hmm. So I think what we're trying to do here is say, New Yorkers, we need your help. You need to keep our elected officials, certainly our feet to the fire, keep doing that. Right? But also, what are the conditions in your home that need improvement? Come to us, we can provide that guidance. We're not gonna be perfect, but the funding is there. And we hope to work with the state and the federal partners to make sure that we're getting our fair share of those investments and that funding. Come to New York City communities and really target um, those 
the, the most affected by climate hazards. Thank you. Um, and looking forward to getting New York landlords to actually take in, you know, take those up. Just lastly and very quickly, and that's, I promise, my last one because I'm getting the eyes. Um, can you name the specific federal funding streams that you're um, targeting for resiliency work? So I'm going to start us off and then I'm going to hand it over to my colleague. Here's what we're saying. There are a lot of different federal funding streams and pots and they're all tiny bits of money. And by, by tiny, I mean when a project is a billion dollars, we have to cobble it together from a project that has, for, from a, a grant that it gives you 5 million here, 200,000 here, 30,000 there, right? And so it just, it becomes a huge, amount of labor for every city agency here to put together comparative applications. So sadly, that's the world we're in, and so we're going to continue to do that. We're going after every dollar to ensure that we continue to move the needle. And we're also saying, hey, feds, what we actually need is formula funding nationally so that we can actually get to the scale of, of to meet the moment, right, and to meet this challenge. We can't meet it with the one million, one million there, right? Um, so what we're trying to do is create programs that we know qualify for existing pots, but also that are shovel ready or design ready or at some level of, 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 of it halfway cooked. So that when we finally get that either from the IGA or the IRA, like here's the, here are the set of, of uh, requirements, we're ready to go. Jordan? Sure, thank you. So I, I think this can be a, a little confusing and, and you know, this was something that came up in the, the, the mayor's announcement er, earlier today. I think because he nailed it, but essentially, you know, we're describing this in, in two different ways. First, the, the Sandy unfinished business. These are the larger coastal projects that we've been working on in, in one form or another over the last decade. Uh, some are still in design, some are uh, approaching construction. And for those projects, we are asking the federal government for this formula funding, a reliable, regular, just the same way we do transportation, we do housing. Uh, you know, we've been very grateful that for the, the larger grants we've received over the last decade, but it's harder to plan an entire city, not to mention the paperwork associated with some of these grant programs can certainly be burdensome, and so the, the timelines have extended. So that's, that's one bucket. The other bucket, and this is what, what Kizzy was talking about, the climate strong communities, uh, so this is an initiative that is targeted specifically around the Inflation Reduction Act and the IIJA. One program I can mention, the, the BRIC program, makes sense for a, a program uh, like Climate Strong Communities, kind of uh, more targeted, focused uh, certainly uh, in, in, in disadvantaged communities, uh, other areas of, of need. And so just to give you a sense, we're, we're tackling this on, on, on multiple fronts and tailoring our programs to uh, meet what is potentially available at the federal government. And can I also, sorry, just to Mr. Chairman, add, add to this and, and emphasize the point that my colleague from DOT made, which is we have to remember an awful lot of this federal money goes through the state. Um, New York City is, depending on how you, you calculate it, 47, 48 percent of the state's population. We are 62 to 63 percent of the state's revenue base. Um, we rarely get 47 or 48 percent of the money that flows through the state. Um, there are a surprising number of state programs often with, uh, that are funded by federal money that have limits, that are dollar limits on what each municipality can receive. There is one that my agency applied for recently, um, a $220 million pot of money. No municipality in New York State could receive more than $10, per, $10 million. By law, that was state law, the agency administering that program put a rule on top of that saying, no, in fact, $5 million is the most any one municipality can receive. So we are stuck at, you know, whatever that is, getting underweighted by a dramatic percentage. Um, and I think it's important for all of us to remember that if you imagine what New York State's allocation of federal funding like IRA, like IIJA are, and your mental math is, well, we'll get about half of that. We either we have to think again and lower our expectations, or we have to make our voices very loudly heard in Albany. Okay, thank you. 
Um, I would like to announce that we are still going to have a lot of questions to U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So if other council members wanted to stay longer, I would appreciate because it's a very important topic. Now I would like to give a chance to ask questions to council member Carr. Thank you, Chair Kagan, Commissioner, Director. It's good to see you and your teams here. Appreciate your time as always. Um, Commissioner, in your testimony, you mentioned the Travis Raise the, Ro Raise the Road project uh, was going to be starting later this year. Am I recalling that correct from your testimony? And do you have a more specific timeline of when that groundbreaking would be? I'll uh, turn this over to my colleague from EDC for the specifics. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Council Member. My name is Adam Marr. I'm Senior Vice President for Neighborhood Strategies at NYC EDC. Um, thank you for the question and the opportunity to speak to that really important project. Just a little bit of context, the Ray Shoreline project um, is a citywide initiative that is designed to proactively address the effects of sea level rise in critically threatened areas around the five boroughs and New York City's 520 miles of shoreline. Um, it does that through methods like uh, rebuilding bulkheads, sewer systems, and erecting crash barriers at the ends of streets where construction will take place. Uh, and the projects that have arisen from it uh, came from a comprehensive analysis of all of New York City's shoreline, identifying the most at-risk areas and selecting particular infrastructure improvements to protect neighborhoods and homeowners from what in the future would be daily tidal inundation if we do not act. Um, in general, all of the projects associated with Ray's shoreline, which is being implemented by EDC's Capital Program Division, are expected to be complete, some in 2023, all by the end of 2025 for Travis Avenue on the West Shore specifically, which is going to reduce nuisance flooding on a really important road that, as you know, crosses a wetland and wildlife refuge. Uh, national grid work should begin by the end of this year, pending some approvals, uh, and roadway elevation is anticipated to begin next summer with completion by the end of next year. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, Commissioner, I'd now like to turn more to the seawall project. Um, the Army car and Corps entitled that the South Shore of Staten Island is actually the East Shore of Staten Island. I know you're only calling it that for the sake of clarity, but for us it's regarded as kind of a bad joke on the Army Corps' part because we actually asked them to protect the South Shore waterfront and they decided not, they could not do that in this project. But I had, uh, you had referenced the issue of the Army Corps' mission in terms of getting this done in conjunction with remedial work. My understanding is that that issue was resolved uh, and a different division of the Army Corps is going to be doing the remedial work at Great Kills Park. So uh, is it your understanding that, that that jurisdiction issue is behind us? Uh, yes, I believe, and I don't know if uh, um, yeah, that would be great. Rebecca can answer um, the specifics of, of the jurisdictional issue. I think the challenge that we've faced, and, and, I, and again, I, I will reiterate, I think the Army Corps uh, is operating under the constraints of, of their mandate and the rules w uh, that, that govern their, their operations. A lot of the issues have had to do with the extent to which there's the remediation work there's the stormwater protection work that DEP is responsible for, and all of it has to be driven through the Army Corps' design and project. Um, and it's, it, it is a lesson that I think we've all learned about the extent that if, if you say this project is only for coastal inundation protection, it will lead you down a very bad path because inevitably when you keep water out, you're also keeping water in behind it. You're also likely to have impacts on local water quality. One of the things as commissioner I'm, I'm concerned about as I think about the HAT study, which again, I'm very enthusiastic about, but it includes some recommendations for seawalls blocking off Jamaica Bay, Flushing Bay, places where my agency is responsible for reducing combined sewer overflows and improving water quality, and we have to make sure that nothing the Army Corps does there interferes with the work, or if it does interfere with, the designs are compatible and everybody's working together. So we've got a lot of coordination to, to go forward. I think the Staten Island project, um, my hope is that, that 10 years from now, we will look back on the, at the 20 year hearing, and we will say we learned a ton from that Staten Island project that taught us how the city and the Army Corps can work together really well 
going forward, and that shaped the 10 years from 2022 to 2030. And institutionally, DEP deserves a lot of credit for making sure that that drainage issue you referenced is incorporated into Thank this, and, 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 and I appreciate that. And so do the people of Staten Island, I think, once it's built. But, but since I'm running out of time, just a couple of questions, and then we can come full circle to your colleagues. Uh, my understanding is that the costs went up, you know, projects sit and wait and the price tag increases. Do we know uh, what that increase is as the federal government agreed to give its share and do we have the non-federal share ready to match? And then in, a, in addition to that, um, I also want to bring up the issue of the MS4 stormwater permitting process. I know that the cities got renewed by the state at the beginning of the year with some additional requirements. And one of the things that I've said to parks in particular was that if we're going to be imposing additional uh, impositions on private development, the city also has to do its part in engaging in stormwater retention on its own properties. And I think that some of our lakes and ponds in our uh, parks are a good way for us to do that, particularly ones that are proximate to hard hit neighborhoods like uh, that we saw in Hurricane Ida just last year. And so if we could talk a little bit about that in addition to answering my questions about the seawall. Thank sure, um, and I will defer, maybe Rebecca, you have the numbers about uh, the Staten Island project. I, I don't have that off the top of my head, but to your, to your final point, yes, there's no question that, uh, that the, um, uh, the, the stormwater management requirements on, on private developments are a really important component of our overall citywide efforts to both reduce combined sewer overflow and improve the quality of the harbor, but also to protect ourselves against stormwater. And you are 100% right that we have to make sure we are doing everything we can on city property. To that end, uh, when I mentioned earlier the idea of a citywide blue belt strategy, and I define blue belts in this case somewhat broadly, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll highlight one example that's very much on parkland up in the Bronx at Tibbetts Brook, where we're working closely with the Parks Department to daylight a, a historic brook that was turned into a culvert, turn it back into a brook. A brook has much greater expansion capacity um, in an extreme event, and so we think that'll actually have a significant impact on reducing the flooding. That was a neighborhood that got very hard hit uh, during Hurricane Ida, and that project, I think, is a template for work that we will be doing. Um, in fact, just as recently as this morning, uh, Commissioner Donahue and I were talking about the coordination that we are setting up between our agencies to make sure that we are looking at parks property as prime opportunities for that. So I think we are very much doing uh, what you are pointing out. Hi, Council Member. I'm Rebecca Fishman. I'm a senior policy advisor at the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental <coughs> Justice. Um, and I, forgive me if I haven't remembered all your questions, but I'm going to try to answer each one of them. So your question on the remediation of Great Kills. So the Army Corps and the National Park Service came back to the city with a proposal that was much costlier and took much longer than we anticipated. So we have formally requested that they redesign uh, that section of the project to avoid the contamination at Great Kills. We think ultimately that this would save the city a fair amount of money and would speed up the project by at least five years if they do so. So we're still waiting to hear. We hear there is an alignment that might work um, and we hopefully get that soon and we'll share as soon as we can. On the budget side, you're right, the costs have increased. Uh, I believe the Army Corps is in the process of answering questions from Congress on those on those increase of costs. You can ask them when they're, when they're here. Um, I believe the initial project budget was 615 million and it is now 1.7 billion. Uh, but that um, is all public information um, and you can kind of see what they've submitted to Congress to find out more. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Carr. Thank you for your answers. Uh, I wanted to give a chance to ask question to Council Member Lee. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I think Council Member Williams and I are going to tag team with each other because we actually do share a lot of the same borders and neighborhoods and districts. So my, my southern part is her northern part. Um, and I just had a really quick question because I noticed in the committee report, can you expand a little bit on FloodNet? And the reason why I'm asking is because um, I'm curious to know 
how we can use that or if it has the capacity for us to utilize that as a way to put the sensors out and identify new areas. Because as we know, the, the landscaping and, and the, the rain patterns and everything, the environment is changing. So how do we use that to identify new potential flood zones? And the reason why I guess I'm asking that is because in our districts, we do have folks that lost everything during her, uh, Hurricane Ida last year, and they are not qualified for anything because it's not considered a flood zone by the insurance companies. And so how do we utilize whatever tools we have at the city to push push that, if possible? Uh, yeah, actually, does he want to keep going? Sure. I, I will start us off um, and uh, follow up with a commitment that we can sit with you both and have this conversation and understand your needs. So FloodNet is a sensor network that we are deploying citywide. We're really looking at targeting the sensors. It's just 500 of them. That's where we are uh, by in the next five years. And we are targeting areas that have that uh, consistent flooding patterns, but also areas that will help us with emergency communication, road closures, like that's the idea, right? We want to make sure that we are capturing various areas of the city where we would be um, able to, to, um, to respond and be able to share information with the public real time, right? So we are happy to, to have a sit down with you both and, and be able to understand where you would like the sensors placed and we can share more about the zones that we're targeting. Okay, yeah, I'd be curious to see over time how that would actually see newer areas that are consistently seeing flooding and That's why right. that is. Um, and then, of course, I know that in parts of Southeast Queens that we share, you know, the water tabling is an issue. And, and is that, I know that the mayor had mentioned something about this, but is the, is the pumping and the getting rid of the water, um, because that's usually also, we saw not only the heavy rainfall, but the water tables, because of the way they are, there's constant flooding because the draining is not happening. So just if you could speak a little bit to that as well. I, I, I believe, Council Member, you're, you're talking about the, the aquifers and the fact that uh, as of about 15 years ago, New York City stopped relying on groundwater for drinking water in, that, in those parts of, right. of your shared district or your the shared parts of your districts. I'm getting the words wrong. You know what I mean? Um, you're part of town. Uh, and um, as a result, because we're not extracting the water, the water is accumulating, the, the groundwater level is rising, and that leads to a higher propensity um, for flooding in, in basements. Um, that is not, strictly speaking, something that's about climate change. Right. Um, it is, of course, something that's very real to the residents. Uh, it is something that I, I, I won't tell you that we have a plan. Um, I will tell you, however, that I'm personally thinking about it, and we at DEP are going to be working on a plan to take that seriously. There are a couple of projects that that um, we'd be ha I'd be happy to share in greater detail offline that we are doing that are um, important to get us to an overall solution to this problem. There is one project that we are undertaking with the U.S. Geological Survey to do uh, um, an updated, more detailed map of all of the underground water across the city. That's going to be really important. Um, to really make sure that we understand where all of this is. Uh, there, is um, all, there are also a couple of pilots that my agency is doing around specific infrastructure changes, things called French drains, which we've redesigned uh, a, a couple of catch basins in your part of the city that uh, will automatically allow groundwater to be dumped into the sewers um, where the groundwater is actually rising so high that it's getting to the level that the sewers are, which is kind of the point at which it really does cause uh, flood risk to, uh, to your constituents. If those designs work, then they become the kind of thing that maybe we can do on a replicable basis uh, across that area. But I will, um, I will commit to you, it is something that I, I don't think the city has taken as seriously uh, in the last 15 years as it should have, um, but it is something that, that I've heard loud and clear and something I am taking very seriously. Do you have any updates on the pilot? Because I know a couple of months ago, 
there was a meeting that the borough president convened, and I know on the previous hearing you mentioned the pilot, but do you have any like tangible updates on where you are with the project? I, I apologize, council member. I do not know where it stands right now, um, and, and I would hate to give you misinformation, so I'd be happy to follow up, and, and Carly, uh, my colleague from DEP is here. We'll get back to you. Yeah, I think it would be good to just get feedback and <clears throat> accuracy around timeline because I know in my office, this is something that people follow up with me about every single time I'm in the community, especially those communities that are dealing with groundwater flooding. And I even said, no, the commissioner said he's working on it and there's a pilot and the pilot's gonna do like another underground survey and they laughed at me and said, this has been done already. I don't know if this is true, but I'm tossing it back to you because they said, this has been done already. How many times is the city going to, you know, do these studies and assessments that only prolong the actual implementation of a tangible solution? So I just wanted to honor them when <laughs> I tried to say, no, this, you know, they're like, no, this has been done. And the people in my community that have been working on this issue have been working on this issue for years. Oh, I no. probably was still in high school yeah. or junior high school. So they are way more experienced than me and they have a lot of <coughs> receipts as, as we say, they have receipts and, and statements from DEP, statements from when Jim Gennaro was the, the chair <laughs> his first time. I mean, no, I'm serious. It, yeah. it, it dates back. So it's, it's yes. Am I in trouble? Am I in trouble? <laughs> no, okay, we're, just, we're just underscoring how, how long, long this has persisted and the constant comeback is we need to do another study, we need to do another assessment, yeah. which actually, again, does not solve yeah. the problem. Council member, look, I, I, again, I, I will say, I, I, number one, I, I know some of the constituents you talk about and there, there is no question that, that they have a great deal of expertise in history. Um, I'll reiterate the fact that I, I think my agency did not take this issue, um, did not own it the way that I think we ought to um, in the past, so I don't blame them for a certain amount of cynicism. Uh, but, um, you know, look, I'd, I'd love to talk with you about a way I think, you know, you're right. It is actually, frankly, a little embarrassing for me to have to say that we talked about it at uh, the IDA or the emergency hearing in August, I think, uh, was last we talked about it. And, and I can't tell you exactly what's happened. So perhaps we need to set up some sort of regular uh, occurring meeting as, as an update just so you're fully aware. It, it prompts me to make sure that I'm asking my folks uh, all of the right questions and um, we give it the attention that it deserves. Thank you. Oh, yeah, well, sorry, we have one more. Please. Yeah, sorry, and I know I'm next, right? So when does time? You already used your time. We're combining, we're combining, <laughs> oh, we're combining, our, we're combining our time, time. yeah. Okay. okay. Oh, the chair said there's no time. That's so oh. sweet. No, um, did you finish? Uh, Council member, did you finish? No, we're together. We're okay. Together. Same team. Okay, good. Good we're, teamwork. We we think like one brain. We're also teamwork. both Queen's delegation chairs, so you know we work together a lot. So she actually just remembered or reminded me um, that another question that we wanted to ask is around the application for FEMA money for Hurricane Ida. I know we're talking about Sandy, but. Circling it back to Sandy, the build a back program that so many people in our collective neighborhoods reference all of the things that happened in Hurricane Sandy and the lack of that same attention to the issues that they're dealing with the Hurricane Ida. It is my understanding that there, the agency has not initiated an application to apply for FEMA funds in which that was the case during Hurricane Sandy, so we just want to understand if the administration has any goals to initiate an application to receive FEMA funds to oh. support for a special for a special project because we were told that there are special funds that municipalities states can apply to for special projects like build it back and so we just want to understand if there are any I'm sorry yeah I, I think you're talking about a FEMA mitigation housing right. grant, right? So, do you want to think? Well, it wouldn't be, this is your emergency management, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, it wouldn't be emergency management though. Like emergency management is only there to help the agency in their application process, but the agency itself has to initiate the application process. Sure, so I don't, so the, we do have a, another one that's managed by NISM and uh, HPD. Um, it, it really has not, uh, less to do with the hurricane, but FEMA offers these, uh, you know, these mitigation grants. So it, it is a very lengthy process to apply for it. Um, I think we can start that discussion to, to, to do it. Um, you want okay. to explain well, about the no, grant? <clears throat> And so again, I'm Heather Ryder from Emergency Management. I think going into the complexities that we've discussed before, the FEMA funds for hazard mitigation assistance is nuanced and has um, complexity. So yes, we do help agencies, but again, I think um, it probably requires a few different agencies to have a further conversation about what it would look like to um, package and apply um, with a few agencies at the table. Yep. Okay. And, and I just I just want to add. So the, the Build the Back program is funded by CDBG dollars that are that are assigned specifically towards uh, that event and that storm. For Hurricane Ida, um, the city uh, created a supplemental grant program where we've been working with your office and did a few tours um, that you know the city funded that will give uh, homeowners uh, up to seventy two thousand dollars in direct grant for not only to reimburse them for work they may have already done, but also to complete work and do some resiliency measures if that's what they choose as well. And that's immediate, that's ongoing. We work with um, a MIT in your Hollis community um, very closely. Um, so th that, that's ongoing in, those, in your neighborhoods now. Okay, I'll follow up with you guys. You got it. I think I heard a commitment to potentially looking into applying. Okay. Something else that you is worth noting, so I'm um, Kim Darga, I'm the Deputy Commissioner Gentleman at HPD. And in addition to looking at federal funds, we actually have, specifically for housing, if this, this is partially about housing issues, we have expanded um, assistance to help specifically homeowners address resiliency needs in their properties. Um, as part of the housing blueprint, this. Uh, spring, summer that we released. Um, we made a commitment to expand Home Fix. Home Fix 2.0 will have money available for homeowners to do resiliency work as well. Home Fix 2.0, yep, it's available now, but we're scaling it up. It'll have um, funds available for homeowners to do energy efficiency, resiliency. Um, so in addition to some of the federal resources that we've been looking at, we have actually committed city funds as well. Okay, thank you very much. Now I would like to give a chance to speak to Council Member Paladino. Good afternoon, thank you very much uh, for being here. It's a pleasure to finally meet you. I've met so many with DEP and I just want to start out with saying thank you from District 11, uh, District 19, sorry, I'm in my Senate district. District uh, uh, 19 wants to thank you. We had a town hall and uh, we did a walkthrough. DEP was fantastic. And my constituents and myself, thank you very, very much for this. Uh, you took the time, you came out, you met the neighbors, and boy, they were angry. Not everybody was happy. And with all due respect, they had every reason to be because what's going on in our neighborhoods, Linda neighbors me as well, it affects homeowners directly. And they are being affected every time it rains. Every time I hear a forecast, I never thought rain would ever bother me. Every time I hear two to four inches, I say, oh my God, what's gonna happen? And sure enough, these people are getting, uh, with Eider, they were, they were wrecked, totally wrecked. They had between three to six to eight feet of water, but worse than that, there was raw sewage. And now, one year later, 10 days, on the 12th of September, they were killed again with only two inches of rain, three inches of rainfall. So this is an area that is not affected at all by the Long Island Sound. This is infrastructure. And Kizzy, you mentioned early on in the uh, hearing, and you, you nailed it, uh, when you said that uh, people are overbuilding 
There's no place for runoff anymore. There's no green left. You mentioned a driveway. Well, I've got about 100,000 of those driveways. And it's absolutely, it's absolutely crazy. You mentioned uh, French drains, and that's exactly what they're talking about. What we need to do in my district, and I know through you guys coming and you're still there, we have so many projects going. College Point is a tremendous, tremendous last 10 years. Absolutely, you got, uh, you got DDC there, you got DEP there, you got Con Edison there, but they've been like this now for better than 12 years. And like my uh, colleague said, people keep asking when and when and when. I need to start to bring some real solid answers back to College Point. The people in the rest of my district from the Whitestone down to the Douglaston Little Neck area, it's, 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 a, it's a troublesome thing, but we, you're dropping the cameras down there. You're gonna actually walk the sewer line. I held a uh, town hall, a Zoom town hall, which you were kind enough to do with me. There were over 100 people on that Zoom town hall with over 300 questions and people who were waiting to get in. To say it was a huge success is an understatement, but to say there's more work to be done, that showed in the 300 comments. So um, I look forward to working with you. I want to know a whole lot more about Build It Back. I just heard about expanding Home Fix 2.0 uh, because people are running out of money. As, as Linda said here, the uh, homeowners insurance are not covering it. On that town hall that was suggested that people start to add on to their homeowners insurance something called uh, sewer uh, coverage which is very important. It's, it would, I have it on my house uh, and it works. So for 50 bucks or $100 more a year on their homeowner's policy, at least they could get a little something back. Uh, I'm curious very quickly, uh, you mentioned $220 million is allowed from the state. Can you just refresh my memory when you talked about the state money? I know we're running out of time, but. Yeah, council member, that, I was just using that program as an, as an illustration uh, of the challenges that the city sometimes That's faces. That's what I want to know. Yeah, because that, was, you, that, is, uh, that is a, uh, a grant program for clean water. So it is something that we applied for um, somewhat cheekily. We applied for 50% of the pot, even though we're only allowed to get five million. I, but that's for treatment plant upgrades. Okay, what I'm curious about is when we, we set aside the budget for you guys, it's obviously not enough money. Are you allotted money from the state? Uh, we are not allotted money from the state. We do you apply for money when, when it is available. And the, the, probably the largest source of value that we get from the state, which is also primarily federally funded ultimately, is that DEP issues uh, a portion of the bonds, or rather the New York City Water Authority right. releases a number of its bonds through the state's revolving fund, and so uh, the interest on those bonds is partially subsidized. How much would you say you get from the state? If the you know, it's a, a good question. I have asked the state to help us calculate that. Because I'd like to see a little break up between, between when the federal, when the feds give the state money, and it's a lot of money. We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars here. And then we get how much of that? I, 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 I'm always a fun, uh, follow the money type of person. Mm -hmm. So I'm very curious when, when it comes to that. Every, we seem to get lost in the mix, uh, the five boroughs, and I don't think that's really fair to us here at the five boroughs. And I know it's not fair to you and you guys who are trying to do your jobs. So I'd like to talk more about it. Thank you very much Thank for you. everything you do. I appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member Paladina. I would like to thank all members of administration for coming today, for answering all questions. Again, it's a very important topic. It's the 10th anniversary of Sandy. We're talking about lives, we're talking about property, we're talking about future of this great city. So it's too important and I'm very, very grateful. I would like to move now to next uh, stage of this hearing. U.S. Corps of Engineers. So if you want to stay, anybody can stay because it's an important topic. Thank you, everybody, on behalf of the entire team. We appreciate your time. Yes.
Okay. You know? Yes. And I would like someone to stay at least to listen to testimonies from the public, from Army Corps of Engineers. At least some members of administration should stay. Thank you. So I would like to invite Anthony Siora, Chief of Coastal Restoration and Special Projects Branch. Anthony Siora, you? Yeah. How do you pronounce properly your last name? Siora. Anthony Siora, from Arm, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Thank you so much for coming. It's very important. A lot of people are talking about Army Corps of Engineers, especially now. So we, we don't need to swear you so you can... Hear me start. now? Yes, you can make your presentation right now. Okay. Good afternoon. Again, my name is Anthony Siora. I am the chief of the Coastal Restoration Branch with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers New York District. Uh, first off, I want to thank uh, members of the uh, Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts and Transportation and Infrastructure of the New York City Council for the invitation to testify here today and provide me with the opportunity uh, to give an update on the status of the Corps of Engineers post-Sandy coastal recovery efforts in the city of New York. As the Hurricane Sandy Recovery Program Manager, I'm responsible for the New York District's $6 billion coastal restoration program in New York City, coastal Long Island, and northern New Jersey. The continued partnership between the State of New York, City of New York, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is vital to the ongoing recovery efforts and for the future, future of a sustainable and resilient New York City. Army Corps of Engineers personnel played key roles in the response following Superstorm Sandy in October 2012, uh, removing approximately 475 million gallons of salt water from critical infrastructure around Lower Manhattan and removing over 3.6 million cubic yards of debris throughout the five boroughs. The New York District directly supported the U.S. Coast Guard in reopening uh, New York and New Jersey Harbor by pulling over 200,000 cubic yards of hazardous debris from the water in less than three weeks after the storm. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is currently executing our post-Sandy Coastal Storm Risk Reduction Program that is funded under Public Law 113-2, which is the emergency supplemental bill that was passed shortly after Superstorm Sandy in January of 2013. This $6 billion comprehensive portfolio required the repair and restoration of existing, eight existing projects that were damaged during the storm at a cost of $242 million, including coastal storm risk management projects at Coney Island, Rockaway Beach, and the Oakwood, Levy, Oakwood Beach Levy Tidegate on Staten Island. A summary of some brief highlights of the work completed and ongoing in our joint efforts to rebuild a stronger and more adaptable city for all New Yorkers. Uh, Coney Island, uh, we completed a $33 million project that included the construction of four new tea groin structures and placing 70,000 cubic yards of sand in the Seagate reach of the project in order to protect the integrity of the existing coastal storm risk reduction project at Coney Island that reduces risk to the res residents of those adjacent communities. Again, that project was completed in 2016. East Rockaway Inlet to Rockaway Inlet and Jamaica Bay. This is a $700 million project that we are currently working on in, in partnership with the state and the city. It's a comprehensive coastal storm risk reduction project that includes construction of a reinforced dune, new and rehabilitated groins, and beach renourishment along the Atlantic Ocean shorefront. The project also includes nature-based measures with structural features to be constructed along Jamaica Bay shoreline to address more frequent storm surge flooding. Two construction contracts totaling $340 million are ongoing 
along the Atlantic shorefront until early 2026, while design work continues on the Jamaica Bay features with construction scheduled to start in 2025. The South Shore of Long Island. Uh, this is a $1.7 billion project where design efforts are continuing uh, for, for a coastal storm res risk reduction measures that will help reduce risk to vulnerable low-lying communities between Fort Wadsworth and Oakwood Beach, where 24 fatalities were suffered during Superstorm Sandy. The project includes the construction of a five-mile-long buried seawall and associate in associated interior drainage features. Finally, the Corps of Engineers is working on the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary Study, or HATS, which is expected to provide additional coastal storm risk reduction options for at-risk communities throughout New York City and areas throughout the harbor estuary. The HATS draft feasibility report and integrated Tier 1 environmental impact statement was recently released for agency and public review and the comment period is currently open until January 6th, 2023. USACE is currently coordinating with the non-federal partners on scheduling public meetings this coming November and December. The feasibility study is scheduled to be completed in June 2024, at which time congressional author authorization will be needed for construction of the recommended plan. The tentatively selected plan has various types of coastal storm rice management features identified in many areas of New York City. We will be happy to provide more details on the draft report and tentatively selected plan to the New York City Council shortly, as was recently requested of our study team. And in fact, I, I can add to my testimony that a meeting is being coordinated with the City Council uh, for next week. It uh, hasn't been confirmed yet. In closing, I want to stress that the Army Corps of Engineers and our non-federal partners have not lost our sense of urgency for completing these important projects as soon as possible in order to reduce the risk to coastal communities that remain vulnerable from the impact of future storm events. Although we understand the frustration of our stakeholders and the public that our process requires time due to the extremely complex nature of these projects and the environment in which they are located, we are still pushing to move everything forward as quickly as possible because we understand that the risk still exists. Our Sandy Recovery and Coastal Program continues to be a priority for our agency, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, as we approach the 10-year anniversary of Sandy this coming weekend. Again, thank you for inviting me to speak in front of your committees today. The Army Corps of Engineers New York District is proud to call the City of New York a great partner in our joint efforts to reduce coastal storm risk for all New Yorkers and to build a more resilient and robust city for residents and visitors to enjoy for many years to come. Thank you for coming, thank you for testifying, and I like that you emphasize that uh, you understand the urgency of the situation because though sometimes we're talking about 10 years, 20 years, five years, people are very frustrated now we say, we marked 10 years anniversary of Superstorm Sandy, and a lot of uh, people in New York City feel like very few things were done since 2012 to make our city significantly more resilient and prepared for the next Superstorm or hurricane. And Army Corps is like tremendous import, tremendously important part of the uh, solution. That's why we're, we appreciate your time. So. Um, I'm a little bit biased. I represent a beautiful neighborhood called Coney Island uh, that suffered tremendously after Superstorm Sandy. And I, I wanted to ask you two questions right away about Coney They're both related to Coney Island, but second question is actually citywide. My first question is about um, Coney Island boardwalk and uh, Coney Island beaches. It's all interrelated. Um, administration mentioned that they're working together with U.S. Corps of Engineers. So the plan that you mentioned will incorporate uh, funding and plan to make Coney Island more resilient and to restore the beauty and resiliency of the landmark Coney Island boardwalk. That's my first question. Is it true? Are you doing anything about it? Is it a part of the plan? 
Well, the current tentatively selected plan for the, uh, the HATS, the Harbor and Tributary Study, does include the line of protection that extends uh, across P Coney Island and actually meets high ground closer to the, uh, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge in Bay Ridge. And uh, we are not at that level of detail yet because we're in the study, but I would uh, strongly recommend that the City of New York in their formal comment uh, to the tentatively selected plan during this, uh, this public comment period, uh, include your requests and recommendations for how the Coney Island Boardwalk could be incorporated in such a, in, into such a coastal resiliency plan. Similar to the, what we're doing on, on the South Shore of Staten Island, right, where there is an existing boardwalk. Uh, we're going to be building a buried seawall where the new boardwalk will be on top of that seawall. From what I know, that, that's the plan. At least that was announced today from what I know, but like, I just would like to emphasize how important is it, not just for, for Southern Brooklyn, but I believe for the entire city of New York. And second question is also related sea walls. I know that it's a part of the plan to build sea walls, and not just around Coney Island, but in other areas as well. I don't know, someone mentioned uh, Shipset Bay in, in Brooklyn and some other areas. So is it also true that uh, are we talking about sea walls being built inside this plan? Yes, the, there are areas uh, of the plan that include shore-based measures such as uh, sea walls, uh, raised bulkheads, and, and promenades. That, that's all part of the tentatively selected plan. Okay, and we're already talking about comments this time from City of New York. So my first question related to this uh, feasibility report. Um, have you received any public comments already? Because I know that the, this impact statement was released on September 24. Is the public comment period op open through January 6. So did you receive any public comments? If yes, like, can you speak about some of these comments? I, I can say that we have received comments, uh, uh, many public comments by, by email because we have mm -hmm. set up uh, you know, electronic uh, means. Uh, I, I do not know the nature of those comments yet, though, sir. We, we haven't uh, gotten to the point where, where we summarize them. I, I'd have to talk particularly to the, to the project manager, but uh, being that the comment period is con continuing to be open until January, and we're going to have extensive public outreach and in-person public meetings scheduled over the next couple of months, uh, you know, we're, we're going to wait until the comment period closes and then uh, before we formally address, uh, address those comments. Uh, so you're basically talking about, the pl I, that's my next question, what are your plans to engage public even more so more people will know about these plans and more people will send their comments? Yes, we, we have heard from our, our local partner, the City of New York, uh, that they, they would like to see at least one public meeting in each of the five boroughs. Uh, of course, we also have the two non-federal sponsors, the, the states of New York and New Jersey, uh, who have requests for, for public meetings as well. But uh, at this point, we have committed to at least eight in-person public meetings, as well as numerous uh, virtual meetings. We've actually already had a, a number of virtual meetings where we've given briefings out to non-governmental organizations, environmental groups. Uh, we had one this past Monday. I believe there's another one this week. So the virtual meetings have already started. The in-person public meetings will take place in November and December before the holiday season. Thank you. So the next question is about th that this report used the law to moderate sea level rise prediction. How did you come up with this why it's law to moderate sea level rise prediction? Um, could you elaborate how Army Corps choose this alternative 3B? It's called alternative 3B as a best alternative. We, we chose the low to moderate uh, sea level uh, prediction based on our latest guidance. That's, that's we're following the Corps of Engineers uh, guidance for, for uh, coastal storm risk management studies. Uh, as far as how we came up with alternative 3B, uh, a n number of factors went into that. Uh, a big part of it was uh, economics. We have to look at the, the Corps of Engineers when we recommend any plan for any type of project, we have to show economic justification, meaning that the benefits of the project, the benefits that, that are derived from the project, and in this case, damages prevented to, to uh, structures and infrastructure uh, 
have to exceed, outweigh the cost of constructing the project. So that's one of the main factors that went in there. Uh, we looked at that large surge barrier uh, outside the harbor uh, between uh, Sandy Hook, New Jersey and Breezy Point on the Rockaway Peninsula. Uh, that, that project, though very large in scope and covered in a, 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 a massive area, uh, from a cost standpoint compared to the benefits it would provide, it was not the most economically justified plan that we could identify. So 3B, uh, taking into all those uh, issues, environmental impacts, of course, is very important. We have a draft federal environmental impact statement attached to the report. We looked at those. Uh, we're looking to minimize uh, impacts as much as possible. Take into all those factors, engineering, economics, in environmental, social impacts, our recommendation is that the best plan with what we know now is alternative 3B that's in that report. Now, we are seeking input from our non-federal partners. We're seeking input from other agencies, federal, state, and local. We're seeking in input from the communities, the public, on any and all information they can provide on this plan that could provide something we missed. You know, we're not saying we have all the answers right now. That's why we use the word tentative. It's a tentative selective plan. It's not the final plan. That won't happen for another two years. We're scheduled to complete it in July 2024 when we'll have a recommended plan that we will need support from our non-federal partners in the state of New York and New Jersey and the city before we can proceed and finalize it. Uh, thank you. Since you already mentioned a timeline which is important to everybody because everybody is impatient and everybody is talking like not 2044, but like preferably 2024, something, you know? So my next question is like, could you elaborate on which resiliency measures would be constructed first and in what areas of the city? That decision has not been made yet, sir. Uh, we have not identified which part of this project would be constructed first. But I can tell you from experience that we will look to construct those phases of the project that can move forward as quickly as possible. We will be looking at uh, a standalone component of the project that could provide some at least interim benefits and coastal storm risk reduction that obviously is not going to exacerbate or make flooding worse in adjacent areas. Uh, those areas may include projects, say, on public property, where it's easier to acquire the real estate, which, by the way, is the non-federal sponsor's responsibility to deliver all the necessary real estate uh, to the Corps of Engineers so we can award contracts and build the project. Uh, we'll look at those areas that are highest at risk, that have the most risk. I mean, that there's, there's varying degrees of risk here. Uh, they're all at risk, but some more than others. Uh, we'll look at areas that may have less environmental impact uh, in terms of uh, contaminate material, and there, are, there is going to be contaminate material in this study area. We know that. Similar to an issue we're running into on Staten Island right now at Great Kills Park. We know that those areas generally take longer to construct because of the lead time before construction in order to have a clean site, in order to acquire private properties, uh, we'll look at the financing of the non-federal sponsors. This is going to be cost-shared, to our, to our knowledge, unless Congress says otherwise, it's going to be cost-shared 65 percent federal, 35 percent non-federal. Uh, I can tell you for a $52 billion project, the federal government will not get all the money up front. We're going to budget for this project incrementally by federal fiscal year. So it may not be possible to build the $20 billion component of the project. We may have to build a smaller piece first in order to get the project into construction. And those are decisions we're going to be making uh, in concert with our non-federal partners at this, in both states as well as the city of New York. So, so I can't answer the question today of where we're going to start because honestly we don't, we don't have the answer to that question at this point. Uh, one, again, one Coney Island related question. Every time I talk to Economic Development Corporation about ferry in Coney Island, they're saying, oh, on open, uh, on a seaside, on ocean side, it's very difficult to build anything related to the ferry because Army Corps of Engineers will not allow us to build anything on that side. Have you ever had conversations with EDC about this possibility? 
we, we have had some discussions with them about that, and I would also suggest that that would be a comment that could be submitted to, to us during, mm -hmm. during the public comment period, if, okay. if there's interest in that. Again, that, at, at this point, because we are only in the study phase and we only have a te tentatively selected plan, there are, the, uh, there are flexibility and many options that could be considered. Okay. You know, we, we wouldn't want that comment to be withheld and then the project get authorized for construction and we, we design it and have the plans and specifications ready to go and then the comment comes in because at that point it's almost too late. This is the opportunity now for all to throw any of their issues, concerns, ideas on the table for consideration. So I will tell EDC and I will submit my own comments about this if ferry terminal and a ferry stop will be built around ocean side of Coney Island. First, they have to check with Army Corps of Engineers. Absolutely, yes, sir. Okay, good. So my last question is, are you on schedule to release the Chief Engineer's report by June 15, 2024? And if not, what kind of delays would push this date even back? We are currently on schedule to finish the report and have a Chief of Engineers, finish the study and have a Chief of Engineers report by June of 2024. Okay. So I would like to give a chance to my co-chair to uh, Silvina Brooks Power to, to ask any questions. Thank you for coming and giving your updates. Um, if we can put on the screen, I wanted to have a photo put up as I asked my question. Okay. So, this is Bayview, Bayfield, excuse me, Avenue in the Rockaways currently today, 10 years later from Superstorm Sandy. A, and, and what is there, just to describe for, for accessibility purposes, this is one of the many backyards along Jamaica Bay where um, it is literally seeing property break off and go off into the bay. Um, people have tried to put cement to <coughs> mitigate this. Um, they've put new planks to mitigate this. But because of the, the storm surge that's there, the lack of resiliency infrastructure that's there, um, there are, are families that are unable to allow their children to go in the backyard um, because there is no protective barrier that protects the homeowners to Jamaica Bay. So as you see here, on one lot, there is some um, tile, not tiles, but like brickwork that was laid down there, which has totally eroded by Jamaica Bay. Um, they did some beautiful fencing that also has eroded and broken apart from the bottom up. Um, into the Bay Area. And so a significant amount of homeowners in Arvern along Jamaica Bay on Bayfield Avenue, specifically Beach 65th to 72nd Street, reported to our office their backyards and decks are experiencing tremendous erosion. As a result, their backyards and decks are, as you see in this photo, sinking in, and some are cascading into the Bay. Given the vulnerability of this situation and the potential for further property loss and damage, would the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers be able to address this area independently from the overall proposed coastal storm reduction project of J Jamaica Bay? Well, my understanding is, do you know what street this is for? This is along Bay, um, this is Bayfield, and this is on um, Beach 65th Street. To okay, that. so that is included in the Arvern yep, section Arvern. of our our Jamaica Bay component of the project. And so, let me just color my statements, and, and I should have started okay. with this before I went into these questions. My concern, even in your report, it talks about the ocean side of the Rockaways being um, scheduled to be completed by next year, while the Bay Area is not scheduled to start design until 2026. That is more than 10 years past Sandy with no 
measures in place to protect the property there right. um, and the community because this is our front line of defense right here. And it's alarming that it is taking so long because um, my understanding in the last update we received from the Army Corps of Engineers, DEC, and the Parks Department was that money is allotted for these projects already. They're mm -hmm. there. So similar to my colleague earlier, Council Member Nurse, asking what is it that can move these projects sooner? Is it that there needs to be hiring of more contractors? Because we can't wait right now when you have property that is cascading into the bay. So to sit there and say 10 years now, and we, we still have to wait two years more for the design part to even start in the Bay Area is concerning to me. Okay, ma'am, I'd like to address, I know that there was multiple parts to that, mm -hmm. but just, I'm not sure what document you were referring to, but let me tell you where we are mm -hmm. uh, on the project. So it, it is true that we've been under, underway with the Atlantic Shorefront features now since the fall of 2020. I think we all know that. Uh, there's a lot of activity taking place uh, on the shorefront. We're, we're pumping sand onto beaches. We're building reinforced dunes. Uh, we're building stone groins that, that are going to help to retain the sand. All that work uh, is going to continue until 2025, that construction. But why isn't it happening at the same time? The Bayside so, has a lower income community, black look, and brown community, and nothing has been done. Right. So there's, there's a good answer for that. So number one, design is underway on the Bayside. Okay, we actually just pre presented the 10% design package um, last week to uh, the city of New York and the state of New York for their review. Uh, so that, that was, uh, what we see is definitely significant progress forward f for this reach of the project, because once the city and the state concur with the plan, that allows us to proceed on to the next design milestone, which is the 30%, the city also can start their ULERP, which is obviously very important because uh, this area is going to require the ULERP uh, because of the, the many private properties uh, that, that are involved. What kind of ULERP is it going to require? What kind? I'm, I'm, not sh I'm not familiar enough with your process to know what kind, but I know that there's private properties back there uh, that we're going to require both uh, easements and maybe acquire land and fee as well in order to, in order to construct the project. Um, but to my, to my initial question, is there any way to independently from the overall proposed coastal storm reduction project of Jamaica Bay have these properties um, handled or mitigated? Because currently right now, this is a hazard. Yeah, I understand, ma'am. Unfortunately, we don't, we don't have any authority to do any interim actions. So who there. has the authority? I mean, I, I think that would be either the city or the state. Uh, we, we, we don't have any authority or funding to do any uh, interim measures on, on, on the Bay side. That would have to be part of our recommendation. And once we go to construction, we'll be able to address that. But like you said, we, we, we're, we're three years away from starting construction in that area. And again, and this is something since I've even been elected, I've noticed when I talk to the various agencies, city, state, federal, it's often like almost like a finger point and like, no, this agency has to do it, this one has to do it. Um, but no one is taking full accountability. And again, because there is money for these projects and there is resiliency that's needed, mm -hmm. I'm not sure why when they're on two different sides of the peninsula, why weren't they running concurrently? Why did the bay get selected to be last? Why are they not further along in the process? It's a very good answer for that. So number one, this project has been underway. Well, it, it started back in the 1970s, right? And it was just a beach replenishment project on the ocean front. Uh, back in 2004, we actually started a study that reevaluated the existing project. And at that time, the focus was on the Atlantic shorefront uh, for a number of reasons, but primarily being that was the, the opinion was that's where most of the risk was in terms of storm damages. Uh, Sandy was a wake up call for, for many of agencies at all levels of government. We saw that the back bay flooding coming from Jamaica Bay, the bay. Was, was as, 
I'm sorry? The bay. I know that there's a term called the back bay, but locally we just call it the bay. That's right. but, but just so you know, back bay is a technical term that we use. Mm -hmm. But sorry, right, so the bayside flooding was as significant, if not worse, than the ocean flooding during Sandy. Um, so the decision was made after Sandy, 2013 to 2014, to incorporate the bay side features in and to look at this project as one complete system. The bay and the Atlantic Ocean, one system, not separately. And we came up with a recommendation to build a tidal surge barrier across Jamaica Bay in the area of the Gil Hodges Bridge. That's now part of the tentatively selected plan for the hats. The reason why it was not incorporated into this project is because it was too expensive. The, the surge barrier alone was nearly $3 billion at the time, and that basically exceeded the entire budget. $3 million budget. or billion? $3 billion. Mm -hmm. Basically exceeded the budget that we had, not only for this project, but for the entire program. So we deferred the surge barrier to the HAT study, which we knew was, was about to start at the time. And we kept in what we call these high frequency, high frequency risk reduction features that would address bayside flooding, even at lower level events. Because even if you build the surge barrier, the surge barrier is gonna be open most of the time. The only time that barrier would close is in advance of a large event. But you still have the smaller events, you know, we, we have a lot of a blue, what we call blue sky flooding, as you know, in this community, uh, because it's such a low lying area. So there were features of that surge barrier plan that we kept in because they were more affordable. Affordable in this case means the entire Bayside plan is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of $350 million. So it's still significant. It would be raising bulkheads, seawalls, green infrastructure such as salt marsh, things like that, living shorelines. Uh, we'll do what we call nature-based features, not green infrastructure, but we, we would incorporate nature-based features as much as possible back there. So even the study and, and all the work we did on the base side was lagging behind at least 10 years to what we were doing on the ocean front. And secondly, you remember I answered the, the council um, member's question before about which projects go first. Obviously, the Atlantic shorefront is all New York City parks property. So the real estate was process was, was very easy. It was basically the city of New York giving us the rights of entry for us to go on the property and build the project and then to do the long-term uh, maintenance. Back here, as I mentioned, it's going to require a ULURP. I don't know which type of ULURP, ma'am. I'm sorry, I'm not that familiar with, with the city's process. I just know that I know the flow chart. I've seen it and how... Well, you said the easement... It for me, but yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we knew that this is going to require uh, an extensive real estate acquisition process. Um, we also know, and, and, and I'll use that word again, that the HDRW, which is hazardous, toxic, or radioactive waste, we knew that there's a possibility we can encounter that back here, and, and that's always uh, an obstacle that we have to get through. It's holding up uh, part of the Staten Island project right now. Um, so, so to answer your question, I understand the, the, the public perception, uh, but the study wasn't completed until 2020. So we're now moving in, we, we are now in design. I want to clarify, we're not starting design in two years. Design is underway. Yes, the Atlantic shorefront is going first for the reasons I, I described, but also let's keep in mind that it's one system. It's not two separate projects. And even if we were building the Bayside right now, if the Atlantic shorefront wasn't being addressed, those communities are still going to flood from the waves and the tidal action coming from the Atlantic Ocean. No, I know. And, and, I and of course, you know that, ma'am, that the project extends from, when I say the entire peninsula, it doesn't include Reese Park and Breezy Point, because one of them is National Park Service land and the other is a private community, which we can't work in. But it doesn't, the project basically goes from 149th Street to the west all the way out to Beach 9th Street in, in Far Rockaway. Uh, so all of those communities are included, but again, I do understand the frustration, uh, I do understand the perception, but I just want to make it clear for the record the reasons why the Bayside work is uh, not occurring as far as construction at the same time as, as the uh, oceanfront. But, but we are hoping 
uh, now that we, we're getting through the design phase, that along with the state, our state and city partners, that we'll be able to come up with an acceptable plan to start construction out there as soon as possible. We are, again, we're going to look at the areas that I'll, I'll say easiest to construct. We'll look to start work on the publicly owned lands first if we can, or we'll start with the nature-based features work, because that's not as extensive as raising up bulkheads and building walls on, on, on property. But it's really going to require a lot of support from the community. I, I know that the, 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 you're well aware of the risk of living there and because you have to live with it every day. So we're not going to preach to you about what you live through. But when it comes down to there's going to be property owners back there who may not be as supportive as the community as a whole, especially when it comes to giving up some of their land rights or giving up easements, which they'll be compensated for based on for, for fair market value. That's something that you know the government can't and just. And I heard that before uh, in terms of the acquisition. So it's yeah. not the whole house that it would be acquired. It's just enough of that. Be part of that property. Uh, and in many reason. cases, it may only be easements. But our experience has shown that sometimes private property owners even aren't even amenable to giving up easements. And they'll challenge the federal government. And we're, you know the, the state or the city may have to go through eminent domain, right, condemnation proceedings. Uh, you might be more familiar with that than I am mm -hmm. at, at your level, but that's going to be a responsibility of the state and city of New York. Uh, part of the uh, agreement that was signed between our two agencies back in 2019, between the state, the city, and the federal government, all three agencies, is that the non-federal sponsor is required or responsible to acquire all of the real estate necessary for us to build the project. Okay, I think you answered my, my second question, but in terms, and, and where I will end with you is now that you're saying that the design phase is currently underway, what's the timeline for completion and start, like so completion of the design start for the construction, and then what what's the, the overall timeline for that next phase that can get some relief to, to these homeowners? Man, we envision starting construction in 2025, and qu quite honestly, the, the, the two main uh, activities that are going to be on the critical path will be obviously support from the state and the city with the plan, right, with the design, not the plan, it's more of a plan now, it's with the design, because it, it involves uh, building certain structures on, on public property as well as private property. There's going to be pump stations that are going to be needed for interior drainage to get water. Someone mentioned it earlier, when you start building walls um, on the shoreline, you got to ensure that you're not adversely impacting the community by preventing water to get out during rain events. So that's why in, in many cases we're required to build pump stations in order to uh, physically pump that water back out in, into the bay. And is uh, there any way to accelerate the, um, the design phase? Uh, I, I think we could accelerate if we receive consensus and support quickly from our state and city par partners. Okay, and I'll get you that. And the other one is gonna be ULORP. I mean, we're, we're assuming that that's gonna be, it's gonna be a two year process. We saw the picture, we're ready. Okay. And I can tell you that my colleagues in government, we are on a united front on the Rockaway Peninsula and we want this done. Yeah, that, that would be very helpful, ma'am, because from, from our experience, my experience with the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, the predominant delay for many of our projects is real estate acquisition. That's usually on the critical path. It's not, it's not so much the design. We're usually ready to go, but we're waiting for uh, the real estate to be acquired and if, it's, if there's but delays. To that, to that point, like right now is the ample time to have those conversations to educate the community on what yes. that is. That hasn't been done thus far. Not yet. And I think that in this low, seemingly low period, even though design is going on, those conversations and socializing needs to take place so people understand what um, is ahead of them and so that we're not slowing down the process when we have, you know, what you just saw on. on yes, and in fact, we received an invitation from, I don't remember which civic association or community group uh, for a briefing this coming Saturday. I don't know if you're aware of this. I can't remember exactly. It may have been RISE. I'm sorry? It may have been RISE. There's a number of Sandy events going on. We have two yes. on Saturday also. And our project manager, uh, rightly so, in my opinion, actually supported his decision. He said, we don't think this is the right time to brief. Oh, that was my office. Yeah, you told us no. 
because of the fact that the design was just provided to the state and the city, and we don't even have their input yet. So we don't want to brief out on this, even a 10% design that doesn't have the formal support of our non-federal partners at the state and the city yet. Once we do have that, we think that's a great time to have such a meeting, at least at this point, to brief where we are, what are the next steps are, and maybe this is where we talk about all these other issues about trying to accelerate the process. And any help that the community can give us would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to give a chance to speak to uh, Council Member Gennaro. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, thank you, Chief, for uh, uh, being here. I'm, I'm a little behind the curve with some of this stuff, so uh, uh, forgive my lack of knowledge. Um, but what is uh, the, the, the item that's out now for a public review and comment would be the HAT study? Is that, is that right? Yes, sir. It is a draft feasibility report and environmental impact statement. Right. And, and, and uh, if I wanted to access that, how would I, how would I do that? Like, where to find it? Uh, the easiest way, you can find it on our website. Okay. And, um, and it would be under, well, would it say HAD or would it say, like, what would it say? Yeah, New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributaries Study, and probably in parentheses it would say HATS. Right, and that would be at the, uh, the the Corps of Engineers New York District website. It'll be right on the on the right. homepage. At the top of your thing, you have um, nan usace army mil. That's it. That would that would get me there. Okay. Yes, sir. And then uh, uh, and what are the deadlines? Like, like, what's the deadline for those comments? The comment period is open until January sixth. Okay, uh, and. Would this be the study that would make some assessment of whether or not um, uh, the uh, uh, storm surge mitigation measures like storm surge barriers would be employed? Would, would, would this be that study? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, um, uh, um, are those among the options that um, are being advanced by the thing? I, I don't know the, 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 the format of the proposal is it a is it you know, these are the things we could potentially do one two three four or this is what we want to do like what do you think about it like how is it how, how is it how is it format so, like how, so is it, how is it presented the, the tenderly selected plan is our recommendation at this point in the process based on the information we have and this is where we seek input now okay from, um i what? mean would that, uh, uh, um, uh, um, is the Army Corps' um, vision now to do some amount of storm surge barriers? Is that, is that, is that in the proposal? Yes. Okay. That is okay. included in the tenderly selected plan, yes. All right, that is a- uh, A series of surge barriers around the region. Right, okay. Yes. And I'll, I'll just point out some, that was really my uh, uh, question, and some fun facts on the front page of your statement you talk about the 200,000 cubic yards of hazardous debris that you helped the Coast Guard remove in less than three weeks. Um, people may be curious to know that if you took that 200,000 cubic yards and put it into 20 yard dumpsters um, and you put them end to end that would extend for 42 miles and so you probably didn't know that. I did. You do. That's interesting. Thank you sir. And the 3.6 million cubic yards overall would extend 750 miles, which would go all the way to Milwaukee. Wow. And so a lot of debris. this is what I do when I'm sitting here. <laughs> you know, I, I, I play with numbers. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Council Member Gennaro. Thank you so much, Anthony Siora from U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for your testimony. Very important, especially today. And we definitely, uh, I join uh, my co-chair that city council is ready to work very closely with uh, Army Corps of Engineers to move these projects expeditiously, not 10 years timeline. I don't think it's an acceptable timeline, but if you need anything from our side, please let us know, okay? No, thank you, sir. And again, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. Uh, we do look forward to briefing the city council on the HATS plan. Again, I think there's a tentative date set up for, for next Thursday, whatever it is, November 4th or so. So hopefully that, or 3rd, and hopefully that date works uh, for you and your staffs. Your staffs obviously are invited to attend uh, w whether you're, you're available or not. Uh, so that 
Thank you. Also, thank you. one more thing with the hearings that you all are setting up in each of the boroughs, please take into consideration some of the transit desert communities and um, like Rockaway Peninsula, you know, in Southeast Queens. Yes. We, we are looking to schedule those meetings in locations that are easily accessible by mass transit. Absolutely, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Now we are planning to move to the public testimonies. Uh, thank you to everyone who registered for public testimonies. The first public testimony is from Keon Alexander. Kevin, sorry. Alexander. Rockaway Development Revitalization Corporation. Good afternoon and thank you, Chair Chairwoman Brooks, Powers, and Chairman Kigan and committee members for allowing me the opportunity to testify before the Joint Committee. As we fast approach the 10th anniversary of Superstorm Sandy, I continue to grapple with one question. Is the Rockways as a community that serves as a barrier for parts of Brooklyn and Lower Manhattan any better off today than, we, than it was 10 years ago? And I want to give some context to that. RDRC, Rockaway Development and Revitalization Corporation, was operational less than 24 hours after Sandy decimated the Rockaways. Over the next year, it was community organizations and faith-based organizations such as RDRC, JCCRP, Margaret Community Development Corporation, Church of the Nazarene, Full Gospel Tabernacle, Auburn Pilgrim, Battalion Pentecostal, Macedonia, and many other badly damaged organizations and churches united to establish a supply chain that extended from the heart of downtown Far Rockway to Auburn because the cavalry was not on its way. And the decades of benign neglect to one of the most underserved jewels in all of New York City for decades suffered from lack of land rezoning, comprehensive infrastructure and flood mitigation, poor transportation, extreme health disparities, and then we found out a communicate was a communications desert. I say all this to say that we can talk about investing in projects, changing policy, but if we don't invest in people that goes along with that, it will happen, the, the, tra the tragedies that we experienced during Superstorm Sandy and other disasters, including COVID-19, will again reoccur. While there was a flood of disaster relief organizations racing to save us and a rush of resources to assist in the immediacy of now, many have still not recovered. Frustrated by the layers, the layers and lack of, of familiarity by city agencies with people and communities they were trying to assist, while the community stake stakeholders operated, as a desperate, operated at a desperate, frantic pace to help those in need as they began to help themselves. I have several recommendations for the committee. One, invest in the facility, such as the old O'Kane building owned by RDOC that could be immediately converted to a disaster relief center um, so that when this does occur, it's not frantically held in piecemeal in damage of uh, faith-based organizations and CBOs, but rather centralized. Two, invest in the communications network that does not rely on the internet or satellite so we can at least communicate throughout the Rockway Peninsula as one region. Three, invest in developing a training facility that's there in the Rockways and a warehouse to store facilities and supplies there. And I will give a quick example. The Floyd Bennett Field was a great location to store. The problem was the bridges were out for six months. The train was out for six months. And so although it was right there at the base of the Marine Parkway Bridge, it had to loop back down Flatbush, Belt Parkway, 878, to the only land-based way into the Rockways. So by strategically thinking about how we place and what we're, where we place that would be a wise move going forward in addition to being able to train that next generation that we'll need to 
assist us for future disasters. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. So the next uh, testimony we will be hearing from Alia Sumro, New York League of Conservation Voters. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Alia Sumro, and I'm the Deputy Director for New York City Policy at the New York League of Conservation Voters. Thank you, Chair Kagan, Chair Brooks Powers, and committee members for the opportunity to testify today. We have submitted longer comments as well. The 10th anniversary of Hurricane Sandy marks a significant milestone for remembering the loss of 44 New York City residents. While NYLCV commends the city for adopting numerous laws and policies related to coastal resilience, building emissions, and waste, more must be done. It's well known that warming temperatures due to increased greenhouse gas emissions make hurricanes stronger, rainier, and deadlier. We've seen repeatedly that climate change exacerbates existing inequities, ex especially low income and people of color. Despite this knowledge, rebuilding from Hurricane Sandy has been slow, inequitable, and incomplete. The city still lacks a comprehensive long-term plan that considers all climate change impacts ranging from inland flooding, extreme heat, sea level rise, and more. Although the City Council passed Local Law 122 last year, which requires the Mayor's Office to publish a citywide adaptation plan by September 30th of this year, as of today, the plan itself has not been published. New Yorkers do want a plan, and we urge the City to publish a plan and provide it to City Council and the public. Uh, Additionally, NYLCV supports Resolution 81, calling on Congress to pass legislation amending the Stafford Act to proactively fund the planning and construction of FEMA and HUD coastal resiliency projects. Going forward, the city must center equity, justice, and deliberative community engagement in its climate and environmental planning efforts, especially in areas beyond Lower Manhattan. The city must also invest in smaller green infrastructure projects, such as rain gardens, bioswales, and permeable pavement. Additionally, we believe the city must work with communities and government officials to begin engagement concerning a long-term, equitable, and voluntary buyout program. Lastly, we urge voters to vote yes on the Clean Water, Clean Air, and Green Jobs Bond Act this November, which has the potential to fund wetland restoration, buyouts, and most importantly, ensure that 35 to 40 percent of funding will go to disadvantaged communities. Uh, NYLCV looks forward to working with the City Council, the Mayor's Office, and government agencies, as well as their advocacy partners to ensure a more equitable, just, and resilient New York City. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Well, I, I, I was actually going to. I was actually going to ask that the the, the Council Member Janara has a question. Yeah, I, I I have a question. Sorry to bring you. But you can hear me as you walk. First of all, I want to. I have, I, have a, I have a long association with, with with the league and all the good work that it's done, uh, and I greatly appreciate that. I appreciate uh, the league support for the passage of of the Bond Act. Uh, I'm going to be passing a resolution to Council tomorrow regarding the Bond Act. Uh, in which um, I call for, and I hope that I'll have the support of the League on this. Uh, you know, you may or may not know that when it comes to uh, uh, um, bond acts in New York State, going back to the 1996 Environmental Bond Act, uh, you know, New York City rarely gets what we consider to be fair share when it comes to bond act money. So what you um, uh, in, testified to in terms of what the Bond Act could realize mm -hmm. for New York City and all the critical environmental and you know, resilience and you know climate change needs that we have. Uh, you know our concern in the council, which I hope will be the concern of the of the LCV, because I know it's a very close relationship with Albany. Like everybody knows that, mm -hmm. and so um, so to the extent that the league could use its influence to support our contention in our resolution tomorrow uh, that there be fair share when it comes to the 
uh, you know, uh, distribution of funds. You know, normally, New York City gets very, very little, and the rest of the state gets like a lot. Mm -hmm. And we don't think that's fair, and we're hoping that the league doesn't think it's fair either. You folks are closer to Albany than we are. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, look out for that resolution. It'll be passed tomorrow, and we hope we have the, and again, fair share is not going to be determined tomorrow. Right. Um, but, you know, God willing, it passes, mm -hmm. and then the state kicks it around. You know, we hope that the league will be a voice for um, a, an equitable, you know, distribution of funds around the state, uh, you know, particularly New York City. And I guess if it's the New York City chapter that advocates for that, that would be great. And so yeah. there you have it. And so you opened the door by mentioning the Bond Act. So. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I agree, and uh, we support your resolution. Um, we really hope voters vote for it, and I know that it's important if they voters approve it that we follow up with DEC and how the funds will be allocated. So we'll be correct. And I, I and we certainly do. I, I'm. I, uh, uh, um, I certainly appreciate that, and I don't speak for the chair, but I think he appreciates it too. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much, and um, uh, you know, give my best to uh, Josh and everyone at the league. And thank you. Okay, take care. Thank you. Thank you. And the, outside of the lower Manhattan, all three council members here are outside of represent areas outside of the lower Manhattan. I represent Coney Island, Bensonhurst, and. Uh, my co-chair represents Rockaway Beach and there is, so you, you're talking, you're preaching to the choir. We are definitely with you on everything you said. Thank you. So the next public testimony is Joel uh, Kupferman, Environmental Justice Initiative. Thank you very much, Chair. I just want to say that I guess I am the loyal opposition for this whole hearing. Um, I represent many community groups. I represent two tenant associations at NYCHA, one being Smith, which is a few blocks from here, and Reese. I have a report here that we just received of soil testing at Reese. There's 15.9 parts per million of arsenic. Hey, Joel, you got to talk right into the mic. Okay, 15.9 points. That's way above 1.1 that's considered to be safe. Why this is an issue that I'm bringing up now is that the contractor that's FEMA funded from Hurricane Sandy has left, has uncovered that soil and left it in large pounds, and that soil is being emitted and resuspended into the lungs of the kids and the adults that live in that site. We brought this up with DEP, we brought it up with NYCHA, and it fell on deaf ears. The solution to that is to cover the soil. It's the first, the, you know, the first requirement. They haven't done this. DEP told you about all their, 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 their laws in terms of storm water protection, and our your fellow council member is fully aware of that. Those laws are not being enforced, all right? So all this FEMA-funded construction that's going on is opening up the soils, it's opening up the walls, it's opening up everything, exposing people to it. There is no accountability for those contractors. We've brought up over time and time again, the ten associations, that a lot of this work is exposing it. And at Smith and other places, they, this, they spent $85 million, including stormwater barriers to block the water from coming in. It's ADA non-compliant. It actually locks the people into the building. They proposed a bridge that goes over it. That bridge is now wheelchair accessible. So part of the problem on all of this work is that you're hearing that there's really good plans that are going on. There is, there, these New York City workers are being, being put into bad working conditions, toxic conditions, especially the community. And at Smith and elsewhere, the trees have gone down because of FEMA-funded contracts. They told you about all the trees that are being planted. The number of trees at NYCHA properties are less than they, they were before, and this is under unsupervised contracts. The city has allowed contractors that are breaking the law to be paid to be hired over and over again. 
The city has something called the bad actor policy. When it's invoked, it could stop them. And so part of our concern is that you really have to look at the accountability of where that's going and the environmental evaluations are not there. And I would say there's major endangerment to the health environment of people of color you know, in the city. But the agencies are actually just pointing to each other. And also one more thing is that there is not a proper evacuation plans, not just the spare bridges here. I spoke to the city fire department. There is, the city doesn't have a fire drill or really ev emergency evacuation plans for residential buildings. They have it for commercial buildings. So th there's, the first responders don't know fully how to respond in an emergency when the, when, the, when, the, when the emergency, you know, when there's a blackout. At NYCHA and Smith, there's all this money for capital projects. Those emergency generators didn't work because the money being spent, there's not enough money being spent for maintenance. The contractor walks away from the job, and that's it. So we keep on spending millions and millions, and you could check, you know, it's not just NYCHA housing, it's city facilities, whatever. Thank you very much for your testimony. Could you email this testimony to us? Yes, yes, all right? Yes. And I will also submit pictures, but it's, it's, but I just want to say, it's incumbent upon you to ask more questions of these people that are here. I sat here testifying after 2011, after 9-11, when, when we don't, many of the agencies said everything is fine. It took us a little while for people to, you know, to wake up. But I think Today we ask a lot of questions. Right. A lot of questions. But I'm, what I'm saying here is that a lot of the construction that's going on, it's falling on deaf ears. And at Reese, DEP is fully aware of that. It's in violation of, of, of the things. And if you're aware that they said they blamed it on the water, so the people were left with a false... Send us, send us your testimony, okay. and we, will, we can send it to all of these agencies and even to the head minister, to the higher authorities. Right. To mayor, but I, I, also want to say, I also want to say that this is an environmental justice insult, that uh, what's, what's okay. happening, especially in terms of resources, and also where this... It's, it's also... Not, the work, there's no accountability in terms of contract compliance that's there. Okay, thank you. I hear you. you loud and clear. Please send us your testimony. Okay. It will thank help. And, and, and Joel, if I may, uh, the gentleman sitting right behind you is here from, on the representative of the administration, correct? So. Right. And so, um, uh, yes. you, you know, his, his, his function here is to hear testimony and, you know, bring back, you know, critical information to the administration. Mm -hmm. He's sitting right behind you. He would love to talk to you and get all the okay. facts in, from you. Right, but I, I just want to say it's, it's not a minor problem, you know, but it's, it's a question of enforcement, and the city agencies on all of this work keeps on pointing to each other, all right? And so I think it's really important for city council to look. NYCHA is telling you that it's a question of money. We learned today and before that there's a lot of resources that are out there. And also, they're pushing for privatization of those NYCHA apartments. We're not going to be able to enforce any of these laws. And it's important to point out, the city's owed a billion and a half dollars in uncollected fines. I would also advise you to come to public hearing of public housing committee, because a lot of right. issues you're raising is NYCHA, and we have public but it's NYCHA, housing But a billion committee. dollars of this money is FEMA money that's still going through the city. When, when NYCHA residents call 311 to make complaints, they were told that the city health department and other agencies are not responsible to go to NYCHA, which is wrong. I, ju I just introduced uh, legislation about it. It already has more than 20 co-sponsors, and I'm pushing for more responsibility from NYCHA about 311 complaints, about hotline, et cetera. So we're going to pass this legislation. Okay, thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. And also, Joel, I, I will add that a lot of things that you're talking about are actually executive matters. Um, and you have the representative of the, I mean, you, you, you've told us, we got it, um, but a lot of stuff you're talking about is the domain of the executive branch, and the representative of the executive branch is sitting right behind you. And so I think it's good to make sure he's- I, I, I agree, but also I'm saying is that it's important for you to ask the questions yeah, yeah. For, the, you know, for the people Thank that you. were here, okay? And it's, there's one person here, you know, which is good. I'm I, saying I, 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 I didn't know this when they were sitting Council up member. There. Okay. Council you know, so member. There you thank go. you. Thank you, like Council member. Thank you very much. I would like to emphasize that, like, we have two co chairs of the hearings, and we announce who is speaking next. If you want to speak, let us know. Okay. Thank you. Just let us know. I would appreciate it.
So the next speaker is uh, Sean Slevin on Zoom. Sean Slevin. Greetings and um, to our co-chair and esteemed committee members and guests, uh, thank you for allowing me to provide testimony. I will make my comments significantly briefer than I originally intended, but uh, you do have the full, full comments. Um, certainly, this week we've been reflecting on the fatalities and destruction caused by Superstorm Sandy 10 years ago. And I, I want to fast forward really more current times because this is just building on itself. And I'd like to reflect a little bit on Ida. Um, Ida was a storm, the first storm of its nature that not only hit us significantly on the coast, but also hit us inland, which we'd never had before. The significant cloud bursts of torrential rain. Uh, why that was so important to me personally is because 13 of my neighbors in Woodside, Queens, were trapped and drowned in their basements. This never, ever should have happened. We, as a city, are faced with a triple threat. We have been since Superstorm Sandy, with our oceans rising one to one and a half centimeters every year, our storms increasing not only in numbers but in strength. And of course, our waterfronts being developed as never before in our lifetime, giving access to millions of people who really don't understand the nature of that particular water they're considering going into and probably don't have swimming skills. And now that we have a situation where these storms are coming, not just coastally, but inland, the bottom line is that we simply can no longer avoid water. So all of us need to have a different relationship, need to understand water in a very different way. And all of the wonderful things that are happening um, in the city in terms of protecting our property and our buildings are needed and definitely must continue. There's so much more work to be done, but there's really very little that's helping us as Your time citizens expired. protect ourselves. So what I would suggest is that Swim Strong Foundation, of which I am the executive director, really does have a solution to that problem. We have created a program called Know Before You Go, K-N-O-W Before You Go, and it is an environmentally focused water safety program that looks at water from inside our homes to everywhere we need it out of doors, around the seasons, Thank and you. including wild weather. Thank you very and much. So this information is needed not only in our schools, but also for all of us. We're also experiencing something called sunny day flooding that we've never experienced as a city before. Thank you. It's not caused by rain. It's not caused by storms. It Sean, has everything we, I'm sorry, we just have to pause here. If you could submit the rest and written testimony, we, we definitely value you and wanna hear um, the rest of what you have to say, but we'd like to make sure we get to everyone. Um, but I'm so excited that you are testifying. And send us your testimony by email. Thank you so much. The next speaker is Eunice Ko, and the following speaker would be Kate Boyko Boykurt. So now the Eunice Ko, also on Zoom. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Kagan. Time starts now. Oh, good afternoon, Chairs Kagan and Brooks Powers and members of the council. My name is Eunice Ko, and I'm the deputy director um, at the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. During the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Sandy, I'm testifying on behalf of Nisha and uplifting the communities whose lives, families, and businesses were devastated by Hurricane Sandy and are, in some places and ways, still recovering today. While the city has made some progress and investments in stormwater management, coastal projects, and heat mitigation, these investments and benefits haven't been uh, seen and felt by all especially by communities who have experienced these impacts first and worst due to historic disinvestment and systemic racism. In the absence of resources, community-based organizations on the ground have been front and center in the fight against climate change, ensuring their neighbors are prepared and protected um, from its impacts. Even still, we as a city are not ready for the next Hurricane Sandy, Ida, or Irene. These hurricanes, as well as tidal floods and heat waves, um, expose additional risk and vulnerabilities uh, to the city and the growing need to uplift projects and policies that are multifaceted and multi-hazard in approach and impact. The city has no comprehensive climate strategy uh, with meaningful financing and funding mechanisms a decade after Hurricane Sandy. The newly released ADAPT NYC 
is a far cry from the climate adaptation plan that was legislated by Local Law 122, by which this council calls for identifying and recommending resiliency and adaptation measures and non-structural risk reduction pro approaches to protect and prepare the city's residents, property, and infrastructure. The website released today does not include such recommendations and is woefully inadequate to protect and prepare our communities from this climate crisis. While we appreciate conversations with communities, communities are also suffering from planning fatigue and want these conversations paired with funding for an implementation of tangible projects and programs that will actually keep them safe from disaster today and in the future. Additionally, we need to be a point um, where climate change is part of every agency mission and climate planning embedded in agency budgets and operations. Your time has expired. But that leadership and prioritization is not happening at the very top. Uh, we can be better prepared for the next hurricane or heat wave than we must because the cost is far too great. Not one more person should die trapped in their basement from flooding because there is nowhere else affordable in the city to live. Uh, today, we cannot confidently say that that is the case. So we must do all of this and more to meet the challenge of this moment. Thank you for the time and opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much. The next testimony we will hear from Kate Boycourt. Your Thank time you. starts now. Thank you, Chairman Kagan and Chairwoman Brooks Powers. I actually am uh, I'm the Director of Res Climate Resilient Coast and Watersheds for the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, but I'm actually going to toss out a little bit of my testimony today to just highlight uh, something that happened this morning in, in which I actually saw Chair Kagan uh, on a boat with many members of the Rise to Resilience Coalition. This is a group of more than 100 uh, community environmental environmental justice organizations that have been working in New York and New Jersey to push for a lot of the things that we're talking about today. Um, and it was pretty heart-wrenching to hear a lot of members who were survivors of Sandy talk about, um, and I think it's important as, as we're talking about what we're talking about today, that we really think about, um, as, as Councilman Ressler was talking about, just how much people have paid for this and are still paying, um, as I think also Ms. Co. Um, reiterated. Um, there's three things that I really want to focus on. One, uh, just echoing Ms. Coe's comments about ADAPT NYC um, and then Army Corps of Engineers, New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributaries study and also the Climate Resilient Design Guidelines. Uh, first, related to ADAPT NYC, um, this plan is it was just uh, released today, about a, a month after it was supposed to be legislatively. Um, and I think as the council, part of your oversight job before uh, the next plan YC is produced in the spring is really to make sure that we take what is right now just uh, sort of a, more of a, a list of commitments um, with, with some new additions um, and make sure that it has teeth. Um, just a, a, I encourage you to read the comptroller's report at which um, the market values of real estate in the 100-year floodplain have increased to over 176 billion, a 44% increase since Hurricane Sandy. We need to get real about land use and capital infrastructure and how these plans are tied. Uh, second, on the Army Corps of Engineers, many advocates uh, we've been working with over the past uh, four years or so since the inception of this study to make sure that it addresses multiple hazards, um, that it engages communities in the front lines, um, and that we're prioritizing. Your time has expired nature-based infrastructure. Uh, we're not there yet, um, and there's a commitment for a climate justice and environment work group uh, that we're working with, and we're thankful for that, but we need you to call in the city and the states to step up more as well in terms of public engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. Now I would like to give a chance uh, for public testimony, Dolores Orr, and next one will be Paul Galley. Thank Time you very much. Now. My name is Dolores Orr, and I'm chair of Community Board 14, which represents the Rockaway Peninsula and Broad Channel Island. Um, I've changed some of my comments, so I want to respond to city planning statement during their testimony that they said that in uh, Flood Zone 1, that they're only building to replace that they're not building new, and that is the furthest thing from the truth in the Rockaways. So our uh, census numbers went up by over 15,000 since Superstorm Sandy, and with new de development approvals on vacant land, we expect another 30,000 residents. So it's not replacing any development. So how does the city go ahead and with us not having to make a bay cared for for eight to 10 years, how do you go ahead and put 30,000 more people at risk? 
and one of the agencies that is adding to that risk is the department of transportation they are really redesigning most of the roads in rockaway as a result they are reducing the number of travel lanes um there needs to be oversight that oem the fire department ems and nypd review those redesigns to ensure that in the event of an evacuation or some sort of rescue they are not impeded impeded in saving lives they just can't continue to reduce increase our population and decrease our access to evacuation which then brings us to that we have no evacuation route signage no signage of where the sign uh the centers are 10 years since sandy we've been asking for it and it's yet to happen um additionally i want to say on a positive note i can attest to french drains working your time has expired auburn by the sea was built on french drains across from the beach and they had not one drop of sea water uh, for hurricane sandy thank you for your time thank you so much so the next testimony is from Paul Galay, and uh, please, Chaka Baptista, be ready for the next after that. Thank you, chairs and council members. Uh, I think you have two questions you want to pose to the Army Corps in the wake of this conversation, keying off comments made by um, the climate director for New York City, uh, Mr. Agawala, and also uh, what the Army Corps has said in its draft public comment um, guidelines. Uh, uh, what Mr. Agawala said is don't fight the last war, or at least don't just fight the last war. Sandy could reoccur, but of course, so could Ida and the idea of blue sky funding. So ask the Army Corps this question. What are you doing to implement WERDA 2020, Water Resources Development Act 2020 requirement that the study is modified, the harbor and tributary study is modified to require you to evaluate and address the impacts of low frequency precipitation and sea level rise on the study area. It's not just a storm surge study anymore since WERDA 2020. Ask them what they're doing to solve all three of our problems. One problem is gonna save some people if you solve it, but you gotta solve all three. The other is about this environment and climate justice working group that my colleague, Kate Boycourt, uh, mentioned, and also I think was alluded to by my colleague, uh, Eunice Koh. Uh, my project is a partnership with the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, and uh, we work very hard to assure that this environment and climate justice working group is going to actually change the dynamic. In public comment in the past, it's let's have a hearing, let's do a transcript, story responsiveness summary but it doesn't change the result of the study well the army corps has promised on this study that public participation and incorporation of their input are key to the success of the study that's what justice 40 has given us thank you very much for that you got to live that and so ask Your the time army corps the second question where's the scope of work for the environment and climate justice working group and then follow up to make sure that they actually live their principles. Thank you Two so questions. much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Appreciate it. So the next public testimony is a Chaka Baptista. And please uh, be ready. Next one will be Philip Tull. Your time has begun. Yes, uh, I want to thank you, council members, and especially uh, council member Brooke Powers. Uh, I want to uh, talk on behalf of the Bayfield Coalition uh, our homes, that was my home, uh, shown uh, as far as the, the backyard goes, uh, it is falling uh, into the bay. And that's for me and, and most of my neighbors on Bayfield. And uh, I heard and we heard what the Army Corps engineers have said, but that is a lot of time between now and then. We want to know if there can be some type of expedient uh, uh, fix uh, for this in the meantime to make sure that our properties uh, are not washed away. Uh, as well as I heard build it back and as far as my uh, coalition goes on Bayfield, uh, we have a lot of fixes uh, that needs to be dealt with from build it back and since the administration has changed 
we our calls have fell on deaf ears. So we want to uh, make sure that uh, through this, our calls will be answered and Build It Back will uh, come back and take care of the damage that was done uh, uh, by, by them uh, to my neighbor's house and, and also to my property as well. I will not keep you long. Uh, uh, I will let the next person uh, speak. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Baptiste. I love it that my community is really showing up today. Um, and some of the good things we heard today, Build It Back said that they will be um, looking into the homes that I mentioned in my, in my um, remarks. And um, we also are gonna reach out to DC to follow up for some mitigating um, support that they may be able to provide um, to the houses. So my staff, as you know, will continue working directly with you, but it's important to have your voice on record on this as we move this conversation forward. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. The next testimony is from Philip Tool, and the last one would be Dolores Tool. Same last name. Time starts now. Yes, um, uh, thank you for entertaining us uh, in this uh, meeting. Same thing. Uh, we, we've been living on uh, uh, 6540 Bayfield Avenue for the last 38 years, and we've ne really never had any problems till after Sandy. And uh, even after Sandy, we continue to have some problems because in our home, which would built by Build It Back, uh, we have some issues that uh, they refuse to correct. Uh, we get so many leaks in the house and uh, our property is exposed before it was uh, uh, fenced in. Uh, they gave they, uh, the basement area of the home, they gave us pure rocks. And uh, they gave us a few, just a few uh, uh, cement areas, cemented areas, but uh, that's nothing. And we thought that we would really get something uh, better than what we had before. Uh, I had a roof leak that lasted for a good while, and I still have leaks in my bedrooms where I put bu buckets to catch the water. And uh, in our yard, we, 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 we have problems with our yard, which is beginning to fall in again. And I'm hoping that uh, something can be done for us uh, so that we can correct these problems. Thank you for hearing us so much, and I pray and hope that it happens. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you so much, Mr. and Mrs. Tool, for getting on, and thank you for opening up your home today to allow us to take pictures to be a part of the conversation. And as you heard um, in the, the responses earlier, Build It Back is going to work with my office to come and revisit those, those um, leaks that you showed me. So that's a step in the right direction. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Councilwoman. Thank you. So on that note, we are going to uh, close our public hearings. Before the end, I would like to thank my committee staff, Senior Committee Counsel Jessica Steinberg-Albin, Senior Policy Analyst Patrick Mulvini, Finance Analyst uh, Andrew Lane Lawless, my Chief of Staff Janine Kiriketi, my Legislative Director Alex Timkiv, as well as staff for the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee for their, all their hard work putting this hearing together. Of course, I would like to thank my great co-chair, Majority Whip, Sylvina Brooks-Powers, and to say that uh, we learned today at, at public hearings uh, how important for the city is to move forward, to execute the plans, to have these plans, to execute these plans uh, as soon as possible, not to wait for the next 10 years and uh, also to coordinate work between city and federal state agencies. And we're we are talking about vital uh, survival of our New York City. So I'm very grateful to all council members who joined our hearings. And if uh, our co-chair wants to say something, thank you very much. And at this point, I'm gonna close this hearing. <laughs>